John Roca and Matt Nost are here to bring you the top 10. Welcome, everybody, to another brand new episode of the Top 10 Show on camera. I am one of your hosts, John Roca. Uh, I am Matt Nost, and uh, we are here to bring you another show for those lovely video watchers. I think yeah. we both played at the camera initially. Yeah, we did. When the show turns. Well, I think we do it every time. We're hams. There's a reason we do this. Yeah, there are hams. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I enjoy being a ham with you and having fun and talking about all this stuff. And today we got another great show, another great topic to tackle. Yes. Uh, based on the Ford versus Ferrari film that's coming out. Which uh, looks good. Yes, it does look good. Unfortunately, tonight, as we're recording this, I had to back out of a screening of it, so I'm sad about that. But since I'm not reviewing it, I can go with the masses and sit down with them and enjoy the film. True. Uh, uh, like with everybody else. And, you know, you're also getting another trip coming up. There's reasons, scheduling and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, it's yeah. just adjusted your schedule and be like, I can't see it mm-hmm. tonight, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But you will be seeing it. Just I hope so. The same time I'll be seeing it. And more than likely, you know, damn near everybody else out there. Yeah. Uh, it does look good, though. Yeah, it does. When uh, I heard it announced, I'm like, really? This? Okay. And then you see that first trailer and be like, all right, I understand exactly what you're doing. It's, it's drive. It's de- determination. It's right. willpower. Right. It's can you overcome an almost insurm- uh, insurmountable task yeah. from the jump. Uh, yeah. And they do it really well. I mean, when you have Damon and Bale, you know there's a certain le- level of professionalism. Yeah. They're both just always excellent. Even if I don't really like downsizing, movie was okay. Yeah, downs. Oh yeah, the one with Damon. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was okay. Same thing, uh, Suburbicon. These were not like these were not films that he necessarily knocks him out of the park, right? True. So you wonder how bright is the star shining? Even that Jason Bourne movie was kind of not that well received. It might have been financially fine, but it wasn't that well received to the level that Born Ultimatum or Born Identity or Born uh, 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 whatever the other one was uh, was. Uh, well, there was Born. Yeah. Well, that's the, just the uh, yeah. Was that the Jason Born was the last one. The one that came in with Damon came back? Right, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. That one didn't get received as positively as... the Renner one? No, no, no. The first three, Born Identity, Born Ultimatum, and Born, Born Supremacy. Born Supremacy. Those three are pretty much a great trilogy and put on the pantheon yeah. of trilogies. But Jason Bourne, the one that just came out uh, a, 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 a year or two ago, isn't quite as uh, uh, revered yeah. as those. So you wonder, uh, where's Damon fit now? Where does he go? Where does he find his placement here? And you want him to do well, and certainly something here with Bale uh, looks uh, interesting and exciting. And I had a friend audition for this, and he said it was a great script. So I'm looking I forward to it. I can only imagine. Yeah. I mean, he's still churning out good work. The Martian wasn't that long ago. No, That's Martian excellent. was good. Oh, it's a good point, 2015. Yeah. Martian was good. Yep, all right, all right. He's still got the chops. It's just he had a couple, and there was that one that was uh, funded by the Chinese production company about the Great Wall, the Great or the Wall. Dragon, or whatever. Wolf. Coming in, woof the Great Wall. But you see that, and you're like, "That's an interesting move." Yeah, to really tap into that market, it's business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, now you factor in certain release elements and aspects of the movie that suddenly shifts to Southeast Asia because there's another market that they want to open up. Yeah, yeah. Some do it artfully, some do not. <laughs> Good point. Good uh, point. But uh, yeah, so I, I still have belief, and then Bale's. You know, I, I couldn't tell you. What he hasn't been good in, and yeah. what I haven't enjoyed of his, yeah, 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 it's kind of tough. So between the two of them, it's like, wow, this could really be something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to do it, especially because it's cars. It's yeah. uh, it's old school, like that time when you're into, like when cars are becoming a thing that people are super into, uh, and uh, and competition, little little guy against the big corporation. You know, I love that kind of stuff. So I'm excited to see it as well. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm looking forward to, to watching it at some point down the road. Anyway, how have you been? How's the, how are things? Uh, I'm good. Uh, you know, I'm tired yeah. at this point, but I think that's just life. So <laughs> I don't know that it's anything specific. It's just the constant grind, constant grind, constant grind. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, uh, so it's one of those days where it's just like my brain is is good to go, but it's a nice like, yeah. Even keel, yeah, kind of yeah, pace yeah. type of yeah. thing. Rolling through. Yeah, 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 at this point. It's a long day, and uh, tomorrow's going to be a long day, and the day after that's going to mm-hmm. be a long day. Yeah, join the crowd, man. Yeah, I just I found out, like I said. Just like you. We were talking off the mic. I just found out I'm going to Australia again next week. Uh, so we have to record our episodes ahead of time or so for, for everything that's happening. So it's like all of a sudden out of nowhere, I'm going for four days to Australia to cover, cover something I can't talk about yet. But like, yeah, it's it's like it doesn't end. One day something pops up, another thing pops up, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's the life. It's the life. But uh, it's better than sitting at home waiting around for yeah. something to happen. So I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind at all. 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. 
Uh, yeah, well, Hobbin, was, I think we got some good responses to our first show. I felt like we got some good responses. Yeah, the, the we number of people that were so excited that we were coming back on camera yeah. now. We're just doing this, and it's just the two of us. And uh, a bunch of new people joined up at patreon.com forward slash the top 10 with the number 10. You get the video a week before uh, when it drops on Collider. Mm-hmm. And uh, Let's make that very clear. Let's make that very clear. For those of you who are listening to us on the audio, if you're like, why can't I see the video at the same time as the audio? It's because we're only giving that out to our patrons Ten dollars and up the day it comes out, you guys get it. So if you want to get the videos the day of the show coming out, go and sign up at www.patreon.com/slash the top ten, the number ten. There, uh, pledge ten dollars and above to support us every month, and you will get the video day of. Uh, for everyone else, you have to wait a week to get it. So you do get double dose of goodness in that way, don't you? I think you get yeah. like the double. You get the uh, uh, the idea of uh, he- watching us uh, um, and hearing the next week's show at the same time. So you can get four hours of top ten goodness on camera and on audio uh, uh, yeah. that way. Oh, shit, if you join Patreon, then you got access to all the extra shows That's that we right. do. Mm-hmm. And you get a shout out at the month, at the end of the month, and yeah. there's other things built in at that tier, so it's not just, you're coming for the video. Yeah. We got other stuff, guys. Guys, we, we got we got a, you know, a smorgasbord, a we cornucopia. <laughs> a cornucopia, one might say. Of decisions and choices. <laughs> a shish kebab. A lot of things attached to that one pole. Um, yeah, what else? What else you got? Nothing. What else you got? My dad gave me uh, some guff about me having Fletch. He just texted me. He was like, Fletch? And I'm Logically. like, look, it's the only the second time it's ever come up, and it's my favorite movie. I know. And if I can squeeze it on this impossible list of 75 choices, then this is the perfect list where, you know what? I'm sorry. If we're going to allow – if my list is going to be 35 long yeah. and I have to cherry pick 10 – uh, like I said on that one, it's just like, okay, I only took one sub movie because I had two sub movies. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. only took one of these because I had a bunch of this. Although you did point out that I had three straight Nazi movies at the bottom of the list. I hadn't realized that uh, <laughs> JoJo was like the last edition. <laughs> the last second, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this because I want people to see it. Right. Uh, but uh, that was interesting. Hey, inadvertently, you know, there's a lot of books on the Nazis, so why wouldn't you? There's tons. And a lot of movies based on books I think I've about seen the Nazis. Uh, way more movies than I've read books of that specific subject. Me too. I've probably seen way more documentaries than I've ever read books or movies about the Nazis. That's for damn sure. I just have a, you know, I like to watch those World War II things, and of course, inevitably, they're yeah. going to deal with the Nazis. So it's fun stuff. You have to. Yeah. You have to. And what are you going to do? It's the main enemy of the freaking war. Well, you have one theater of the war. Well, we also shy away from because we were kind of racist and assholes. And the Japanese. The Japanese. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was, look, they attacked first, so we had all the rights. Right. But To be upset. True. Right. But then to stoke the fires and whatnot, is, <laughs> that's one we turn yeah, away yeah. from uh, because it's, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, so you don't see as many. That's, you know, there was Band of Brothers, and then it was like four years, and then we got the Pacific. The Pacific wasn't as strong as Band it of wasn't. Brothers, right? Not even close. Yeah, I found myself, it was a bit of a grind to watch the Pacific, whereas Band of Brothers felt inspirational and like uh, having been in the military. Of course, I didn't serve World War II, regardless of what people think about my age. But I, I, w- I was excited to feel that vibe again in Band of Brothers. Mm-hmm. But in the Pacific, it felt like this grind. And though maybe that's the point to make you feel what it was like in that theater of war. That it seemed endless. And it was more psychological on right, some level. Right, right. And yeah. sadder. The, it's sitting out in the rain, and then the one dude snaps eventually. Like yeah. There was pots and pans or something around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just goes crazy. Yeah. I could totally see that because it's, you know, grand scale Chinese water torture. Yeah. The one where they right. just drip, but this is just constant. You're just always wet. And mm-hmm. you probably got trench foot and what some sort of. You know, Legionnaire's disease yeah, and yeah. all kinds of random things because nobody does this. Yeah, exactly. This only happens in very specific, you have to stand in mud yeah. for, you know, days on end. Right. Like, right. oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, so the Pacific is tough. The only thing I really remember from it is uh, uh, Remy Malik. That was the first time I saw him. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, this dude has something. Right. Like, he draws my eye every time and right. he's not chewing the scenery. Uh, yeah. And then the main kid was the – was he the kid from Jurassic Park? Yeah, Matarazzo. Okay. Right, right, right. But there was a lot of people. John Seda was in this thing too. Yeah, there was a ton of – it's yeah. a you know, ensemble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still take Bar- – Barenthal? Brothers. Yes, John Barenthal. Right, right, right. Uh, was he on Midway? <sighs> Is he in that new Midway one? No, no, no. I'm saying oh, in, you mean in the, the theater sequence of, of that, I think right, he was right, in the right. Midway. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, because the other, the other guy that he was with, actually, when you're driving down to San Diego, the street right before you get to the check mark, mm-hmm. or two streets up, but I think it's the street right before, is named after the sergeant that came back and sold bonds after the war and all that stuff, but they, they talk about it in the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, shoot, he's Italian. 
dang it. All right. It'll come to me later. Yeah. But I think of that from the show and it's like, oh, that's named after because I lived in San Diego for, you know, six, seven years. Right, right, right. Uh, I, dang it. What was his name? I, I don't know. know. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I could open up a laptop and look. <laughs> well, I do that. We're but on camera. I know. What's the fun <laughs> in that? Hey, yeah, I wrote down. I've got my list right yeah. here. There you go, camera people. That's Boom. right. Good to go. Freeze frame that. You just saw a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> uh, Matt had to help me this week. Uh, and it's the first time that's ever happened in the show. In four years of doing this damn show, Matt had, I'll, I'll be honest, pull the curtain behind. You know, Matt had to help me a little bit because... I've got caught. I got caught up in so many things, and it wasn't on the calendar. And I'm not used to us recording it during uh, the day at, at work. Yeah. That now that we're on Collider, I didn't even plan for it. it. Didn't even occur to me in my head. I was too busy, caught up in the laurels of the first episode that I didn't even think about the fact that we had to record a second episode. So <sighs> it came fast upon me a week later. So it's it's the way life works sometimes. So, um, well, there are, our two calendars don't uh, cross pollinate for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Because so I, I ran into it when I opened up and was like, I don't see any of our, all that input, you know, inputted information. And eventually I right. found it. So I, I think there's a personal and then one associated with Collider. Yeah. I and figured they would all bleed onto one because they both come up. I get notifications from both. I get the topics. Okay. And I get the topic thunder and all, when all that's dropping. What happened was that what didn't get transferred over was yeah. the time of, of the recording. And so I got caught up. So Matt had to send me his like two pages of stuff. And then I uh, picked from that and then also my own stuff that I had kind of thought about and, and put it. So the list is compiled. This is my honest list. So I got no negative of, yeah. negative things to say about that and, and the, the, their own no, list. And so if, if there's a, an error, an omission yeah. on some level, please forgive like, me. Yeah, it, it happens also with this. There's back-to-back weeks where we choose a topic where there's a lot of choices. Yeah. How yeah. are you defining double build? Yeah, for me, it's double build that they were both known yes. or at a certain stature. Yes. And the film is good. Okay. This is what I factored into this whole making of my list. Because I disqualified a couple of technically I knew one and then mm. the other one was part of my life type of right, thing. Right, right, but right. But they're not, you know, it's not 1A, 1B. Right. Right. Or they hadn't reached 1B status until the, the success of this movie. Right. And then if they have something after that, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know. It was tough. But eventually I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. If it's truly double build, I knew the two names going into it. Right. Seeing it, it's like I was amped. And even if it's an ensemble piece to me, if there's two names that really stuck out or stick out okay. and are known, I put it on the list. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. I mean, even if it's ensemble, but it's got to be about the two as best as we can get it. We'll see. We will see. Yeah. But at the same time, you did pull from a bunch of movies that I... So they make that definition to me fluidly on some yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So they're all in contention. On some level. Okay. There were some I was just like, no, you don't have a shot. But it's just kind of you write them down, at least I do, to yeah. just spark more thought. Right, right. I just type and like, okay, what else? What else? Yeah. What am I not thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, you know, what am I not this, seeing here? This is like a top, you know, 15, top 20 list. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. Well, uh, should we get into it? Uh, yeah. Once we set a topic, we go our personal way, show back up here. I do my bottom three. He does his bottom three. I do my next two. He does his next two. Then we trade one a piece. Once we have revealed our personal top 10 list, we create the shows between the two of us. Boom. Jumping right in. Let's do it. 10 for me. Tough list. Like I said before, a lot of choices. Yeah. Every, you know, fire away people. Uh, the nice guys. Oh, great choice. I knew Crow. I knew Gotham. Great choice. Yep, 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 yep. Absolutely. So it's it succeeded, and it was actually better than I was hoping it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of charm between the two of them. Yeah. And the Gosling does some nice, you know, Abbott and Costello takes. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, he sees that dead body <laughs> type of <laughs> it's, that's you know vaudevillian acting that you don't see anymore. True. Very but, good point. But it's it's it was so nice to see. It seemed like maybe he was concussed and then he just doesn't know how to process. And why not? That's fun. It takes <laughs> me back to all kinds of things I grew up watching as a kid. His screaming is the best. Yeah. Whenever he has to do that high pitched scream. Yeah. When he's in pain, I think that's very funny as well. And you know, Russell Crowe playing the more lived in. He's done the same job. He breaks the elbow the same way the ulnar fracture, whatever, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, little yeah. spiral fracture because he twists the arm. And uh, between the two of them, you bring the daughter in for Gosling, and there's a they have a great dynamic, and then she has a great dynamic with Russell Crowe as well. Right. And they go off in search of and show up at ridiculous Hollywood parties. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I and, enjoy the movie as well. Yeah, it was better. I mean, I thought it was going to be like, this seems like it's going to be a solid B. Right. And it was better to me than just a solid B. Yeah, I agree. Well, I mean, it's once again, it's Shane Black essentially going back to what he did really well with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. 
Um, Iron Man 3, some people are on the fence about it, like, don't like. That Predator film is terrible. Mm-hmm. But what he does best yeah. are these smaller, uh, character-driven, uh, pseudo-action pieces that are um, distinctive because of the uniqueness and eccentricities of the main characters, right? With Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, it was Val Kilmer playing this gay guy who like mm-hmm. says the most inappropriate shit at certain moments, but funny as hell. Yeah. Downey Jr., who's just this desperate criminal who's just flying by the seat of his pants in every situation he's in. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have the great Michelle Monaghan being part of them as well. But then you roll into Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. You have Ryan Gosling being this private investigator that's kind of terrible at it. A shitty dad. So much so that the daughter really ha- is running the relationship between them. Yeah, without um, a doubt. She's taking over the mom. She's yeah. the... She's essentially the mom, yeah, ex- the yeah. mom character in this situation, right? Essentially, and then Russell Crowe with with all the the um, kind of uh, abrasive nature of him. This is like Bud, whatever his name is from uh, L.A. Confidential, like twenty years later or something like that. Kinda, kinda, right? Although he's a little more self aware in this one than I think Bud could could eventually get to. You don't think Bud would get eventually to? I think he was just sarcasm. Straight bulldog. Yes. And Crowe in this is bulldog with a brain. Okay, fair enough. Does, yeah, because he's so confident, man. He is, and he's also thought through, and he's been in these mm-hmm. situations, so it's just like, all right, even if he hasn't, yeah, he's older, so he just moves a little bit slower. He's processing more. Yeah, agreed. Maybe Bud gets to that. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> What's your nine? Uh, my nine is plane trains and automobiles. Great choice. Great uh, choice. I really, really wanted to put it on the list, but you know, when you're looking at the level of films that are on this list, I could not find my way to nudge something off. But... Because, it's such a good movie. But because the, the list is so wide and varied, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a, I watch this one way more than I do, or that one has an even better place in my heart than this one, which is great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or I've lived longer with this, like Planes, Trains, than I have with some of these others. And yeah. to me, you're, you know, you're both whatever, I, you know, you're equal footing in yeah. my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've just spent more time with this one. I have more of a fondness for this. Right. And Planes, Trains... Like I, I, I always loved John Candy as a kid, mm-hmm. and Steve Martin was hit and miss to me. Okay. But when I liked him, I liked him a lot. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Um, Are you a big fan of The Jerk? Love The Jerk. Okay. But I didn't really fall in love with that until I was an adult. Right. Because of, that's where his sense of humor makes all the sense in the world mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of his stand-up stuff never really resonated, but it was a different time. Is it? Well, yeah. And the unironic, ironic, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Was great because they had lived through civil rights and Vietnam War and just tumultuous 20 years. The assassination of Kennedy, of Martin Luther King, of Bobby Kennedy, of in the the pop culture. So I could see something being so lighthearted and unironic and unoffensive because everybody's like, man, I got enough shit on my plate. And that's why cocaine got big. This is fun. This is nice. I am sick of living in fucking... Just constant turmoil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although it still existed, but it didn't seem as, you know, up and down as the 60s and early 70s. Yeah, yeah. Especially through Vietnam, like a, a war that in the time nobody wanted. Yeah. And looking back, just ridiculous. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. But anyway, so plane strains. <laughs> I don't know how you got to Vietnam from there. But well, you, from Steve Martin. Got Martin there. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so plane <laughs> He didn't serve. Yeah, good. Yeah. He, he did in other ways. Yeah, I you suppose. Know? Yeah, juggling at Disneyland while that was going on. <laughs> uh, uh, so to have these two guys kind of converge in a movie that it also seemed like an adult comedy to me when I yeah, saw it like yeah, the first time. Like sure. Relating to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, not just in the stupid slapstick. There's still that. You know, what are these? The, those aren't pillows. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's crass as it gets. Uh, right, right, right. It's great. It's between the two of them. It's yeah. it's fantastic. They have a great rapport. And yeah. Candy, you could just see how much of a career he could have had had he stayed oh, man. around. Oh, you know, yeah. Because he could pull off those moments, just like Robin Williams, man. Mm-hmm. When he is dialed in, yeah. because those big puppy dog eyes usually get a laugh, when they turn sad, yeah. you just wallow in there with him. Uh, yeah. yeah, those two. Mel Gibson's awesome at that. Yeah. You see his eyes quake when he starts to cry, whatever the character is. Oh, and you're like, yeah, right. Every time you're like, I fucking, I believe this. Yeah. Whatever you're going through right now, man, I fucking believe this. <laughs> whatever place you had to get yourself to. It's a fair point. Um, so anyway, Plain Strains, 
It's just a classic. Yeah. It's an absolute classic to me. Of course it is. It's and it's so it's so funny what they uh go through and what they interact with and and like the idea of the two pillows, all of that's really funny. But then um for all the ridiculousness of the situation, that situations that they get into in the planes, in the trains, and in the automobiles, in those hotel rooms, mm-hmm. um at the end, there's this incredibly tender moment that the film has been subtly building to yeah. throughout the ridiculousness True. of the situations. And then when it hits, you're like, oh, shit. Like, there's some real human stuff going on here. Well, because I think part of it is you're kind of identifying on some level with Steve Martin. Yes. You're just a dude that wants to get home. This guy's nice enough, but at the same time, I'd rather just be by myself. I'm miserable. Let yeah. me just wallow in my type of misery. Right, right. And when that pivot happens, you're like, oh, man, I'm an asshole. Yeah. I am an asshole. <laughs> That was how I felt the first time I saw it, because I was. It was just yeah. like, just let Steve Martin be. I like you, John Candy, but you are a bit much. Right, see? Yeah, exactly. You do feel for yeah. Steve Martin, but then right when Candy's like, Candy wins you over in that first scene in the hotel room, he's like, I like me. My wife likes me. My customers like me. Um, it's it's a, You can hurt me. Mm-hmm. It's, it's easy. And then you're like, oh, shit. Shit. Yeah. But then he keeps doing dumb shit like setting the car on fire and not giving him back his card and just really screwing him over uh, until finally and then get really hurt. Like when they try when Steve Martin tries to like essentially break up with him at the at the uh, table there in the uh, yeah. in the airport. That's so he's like legitimately hurt because he's just like, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, I get it. Yep. Yeah, here. Yep. Yeah, hope I sit. Yeah, right. Right. Sure. You will. And then just walks away. Yeah. And it's like he broke up with him. And it's like, you know, you, you've had those conversations in life with someone you're dating, right? You try to say like, oh no, we'll be cool, we'll be friends. No, 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 it's, it's not going to happen. I was like blown away by that. And then of course, like I said, at the end, just tender as hell. It, yeah, it's almost like high school. It's like they're adults living through. Right. It's a popularity contest of us. Yeah. And one of us is really on board. <laughs> <laughs> Why hurt you? Come on, man. Yeah. It's us against the world. What else we got? Exactly. How many of us never get past high school, for fuck's sake? Or, uh, or regress to it when the situation calls for it? Dude, I, how often do you actually think about high school anymore? Uh, well, because I still have friends on Facebook from high school, I do. A- I, and on see, Instagram. I do, but I don't associate, like I do associate, but I, uh, mm. I think of them as more like contemporary to me as opposed to thinking about high school takes me back to a very specific era yeah. of my life. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I don't. I don't think I often like go back and think about it to be perfectly honest. At well, this point anymore, I've thought about it a lot. You know, you're not really built that way though, are you? Like sure, you know, I'm you know, contemplative you? about all yeah. kinds of things. Oh, okay. I right. think I've just thought enough of that. <laughs> you like you're at this level now where you've thought about well, everything I, you can. Every mistake I ever made, oh, yeah, every well, sure. this, uh, why didn't I do that and uh, yeah, that should not be the impulse for going back no. to think about high school no, 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 and no. all the mistakes. I, well, I don't have that, but I'm just saying yeah. I I've thought through every decision, every Good time and bad time. I've relived those quite a bit, just like any good and bad time in my life. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Uh, so anyway, that was it. There you go. There's my <laughs> there's my nine. There's your reflecting. Eight was a very uh, – it's not going to be on your list. King speech. Oh, good choice. Okay. These I are was, great choices. I was one of the ones that said that year, that was clearly my favorite of the year. Mm-hmm. It was a crowded year. So of those, yeah. I just – I don't know. The magic of that one to I can me, understand that. Is always resonated. I've watched it numerous times since then. Okay. I will more than likely watch it every few years at this point because I just enjoy the gradual buildup and mm-hmm. the give and take between the two of them. Um, okay. One of my favorite points is which when uh, Jeffrey Rush, I can't remember the character's name, but he's the – Yeah. Uh, well, the assumed doctor that then Colin Firth, the king, finds out isn't actually a doctor. Right. But people took to calling him that, and I didn't want to stop him. But he can't help people. Like, yeah. He has acquired that skill, and he knows it more intima- intimately than the vast majority. You saw mm-hmm. all the rest of them with their ridiculous, put all these marbles in your mouth. Yeah, and, yeah. And do all this. And he's like, no, it's a matter of confidence, and you've lost your voice. And I can help you rebuild it. Right, symbolically, that. yeah. Yeah. But he does it with the... Uh, he's got the headphones and he puts it on and they make a vinyl rug recording yeah. of him speaking that first time and to hear him just con- like confidently bellow those words, mm-hmm. the magic of that, and then he has to go back and overcome, but it's the overstepping by Jeffrey Rush when he's like, you know, what's wrong? You could be king. You'd be a good king. And he's like, that is treasonous and this instant pivot and you realize as much as we are friends that I still have. Yeah. I live by a code that does not exist for the average kind of person. Right. But... A 
beautiful back and forth tête-à-tête between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've always enjoyed that. Helen, Helen and Bottom Carter coming in and, you know, as the, the queen mum. Yep. Uh, she's perfect in it. It's great casting. Yeah. All aboard. Do you ever do the two, uh, whatever? No, I've never pinky done thumb, that. Pinky thumb thing to space out? No. It's never been my thing. Like, I under, I've always been aware of like that, but then you develop, you he, when you listen to enough auditions of yourself, you understand where your um, sounds are on the mic. Yeah. So that if you're hitting the P's too hard, or the S's too hard, or the T's too hard, or the diphthongs, all that stuff you kind of learn as you go along. Mm-hmm. When I was first doing it, I didn't do that. I just assumed like kind of from the headphones, that really helps me a lot where I'm at on the mic. So when I don't go audition away Morris, I'd be like, okay, where, okay, I'm here, this is good. The one thing I had to learn though, was when you're doing the yells to step back from the mic. I did not know that when I first started doing oh, stuff really? audition. Yeah, I thought, well, they can just adjust the volume later on and, and post. And you're just like, no, no. They're not taking the time to yeah, post. They got no time to do that bullshit, yeah. right? In your mind, you think, oh, they'll just fix it. You know, but no, those are the things that I had to learn. But no, I never did any of that. I just kind of always like sensed it, so. I never had a doctor degree. So I, I also think, it. too, microphones were a much different technology <laughs> back then. So it's not like it's a very sensitive instrument. It's a very good point. So you had to speak with a certain volume. People still say it, though. People still try to train you to be like they four do. fingers or whatever. Yeah, yeah, they do. It's that novice shit. Yeah. But theirs was double that in right, the time. Right, right, right. Maybe four fingers is the proper. I mean, you don't want to be like straight up on it. They're like Snyder's. Snyder loves doing that shit. Does he? Oh, Snyder loves talking straight, in, straight into the mic. And I'm, it drives me insane when he does it. Uh, well, I'm just happy you got him to talk at all. <laughs> so there yeah, you go. Right, that's Snyder's problem. Is he doesn't talk? That's not his problem. He it's is what he says. That's the problem. Said it to us a couple of times. When am I coming back on? And my response is, when you give me more than a one word answer. Yeah, exactly. When I you, will have you on every week, man. When, if you when, want to. When you respect the show again, you can come back on the show. It's again. Not even that. Just carry a fucking conversation with me, man. You well, do it when you were off. That's camera. what I'm saying. That's respecting the show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, he wants to come on the Cinephiles because we're going to do The Insider soon, and he's been on my ass for a year to watch The Insider. Yeah, you brought it up before. Right, so he's going to be a guest, but like I told him, I said, don't don't clam up. You clam up, I'll kick you off the fu- show in the middle of the recording. I don't care. If you clam up, you're out. The show doesn't work if people are just sitting there going, yeah. yeah. I know. Cool. I like that, too. Okay, but, but why? <laughs> yeah. And why is it as soon as the cameras go off, you're like that... Uh, uh, the fucking WB frog. As soon as the people oh, look away, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're dancing and singing again, <laughs> and then camera goes on. It's just anathema to everything we do here. Some people are like that, though. Some people are like when the camera. True, but he shouldn't be one no, of them. No, he shouldn't be one. You're right. As much he's, as he's on camera, he should not be. Fucking one of them. boxed another damn director, you know what I mean? Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. This guy has uh, lived for the public before. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has his own podcast that he does on camera himself uh, and audio as well, I suppose. Yeah. So, right. Agreed. Uh, all right, that's your eight? That was my eight. What you got? Uh, number 10 is Men in Black. Okay, good yeah. choice. I I mean, Tommy Lee Jones, Will Smith at this time, right? There's another one I left off because at that time, he wasn't a name. He's a name when he does Men in Black. Okay. Will Smith is a name when he does Men in Black. So for me, those two, and by the way, I had to take off another Will Smith movie that hurt my heart to take off, but I had to take it off because of quality films that are here. So, to me... So, is this your only Will Smith movie? This is my only Will Smith movie. Surprising. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You'll notice that was not in the list that I sent to you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I know it wasn't. Uh, you know, unhealthy uh, hatred for action movies. But... Uh, not good ones. Oh, okay. You know, right. I properly enjoy every good one. I'll right. even enjoy some bad ones. Yeah. Because I understand the merits uh, of what they are. And that one, to me, is just weird. I don't get it. It's so good. Um, Everybody spritzed in oil and then action... That's right. Everybody looks like this. Is, so this is Miami. Everybody's just kind of sweaty, glistening yeah. at all times. As Fernandez, he knows. 80s, I'll buy it. Too much cocaine. You know, sweating. Oh, sure. I like, <sighs> uh, no, but Men in Black is great. I mean, like, who who saw this coming? No one saw this. I, mean, I can only imagine what the pitch was like in the room at I mean, a studio for this. Was this part of the Will Smith when he said he sat down with his agent and they figured out what the most common blockbusters were? So oh, he, maybe. He plotted out his next... How many ever years yeah. looking for movies specifically like this? Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. It's smart. It is smart. What it's, sells? Yeah, exactly. And this is still, this one still holds up. Uh, they've, you know, obviously that Men in Black International wasn't that good. And the third one was okay. Second one, not so good. But this one was good. And this one still holds up. I watched it again the other day yeah. for like an hour and I really enjoyed like the it. Third one. Yeah, I like the third one too. I don't feel the need to go, oh, it was pretty good. No, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Stillbark's great in that one. 
Uh, but this one, you know, you have this back and forth with him and Tommy Lee, and it's developing this idea of the older guy and the younger guy. And this is when Will's being cool Will, you know, like, I'm at the top of my game. I'm with I'm with the audience. Like, the audience goes with me because I'm the cool kid yeah. leading this thing. And Tommy Lee is, like, constantly, like, undercutting him. And kudos to Will to play that character that way. Mm -hmm. Like, when he hands him the cricket, and you're just like, oh, that's a shot at him. That's a shot at him, and, you know. But seeing him react to everything and then how he navigates it and then has his own journey. And then, once again, just like playing his automobiles, you have that ending. That's actually a very sweet ending uh, as the relationship has developed. Because it's done so well through the movie, the sweet ending at the end is totally earned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it was on my... Yeah, potentials. It was in that list. Yeah, it just when it stacks up next to others, it's like, ah, oh, this is just a better flat out movie to me. Or uh, I don't know. It, it it got cut for time. Fair enough. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good sketch. It was a good sketch. It was a good sketch. But yeah. look for it on YouTube. There uh, are a couple who are just like, ah, I want to, but no. That'd be a funny. That'd be a fun little show to do. What? Like our our after the ones got cut, like an honorable mention show. All but right. that would be a fully paid show. Like, people would have to pay sure. us to do that show, Why don't we an do, extra amount. Well, since we're talking about shows on the show, you know, very meta, and at the same time behind the, the yeah. curtain, we just save those every time, and then we turn it into a, you know, one of those shows. Yeah. Okay. The cut for time. The best, the top ten cut for time. Yeah. Love you remember it. this list? This. We've got to keep records, and yeah, that's going to be a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I write people everything have to down. Pay us. People have to pay us for yeah, that. Yeah, I, I write I, I, everything down. So it means I got to start typing everything down. And that's fine. But I, in all the years we've been doing this, I've only typed it out one time. I'm pretty much, I like the paper. <laughs> I show up with the paper. I got pads. I like, right, right. I like the tactile nature of it. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's a good movie. Barry Levinson, uh, still funny, still holds up. And uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Tony, Tony Shaloub steal every scene they're in when they're in the movie. Shaloub is so good. It really is, right? So good. <sighs> He's always good, man. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's just the the bargaining, acting tough, and then his head gets blown off. Gets all right, hey, 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 and instantly, instantly, it's such he's so good. Uh, I know, I love it. Uh, uh, oh, and then Linda Fiorentino, of course. I always forget mm -hmm. that she's in this. That's right. Um, all right, so my number nine, uh, and this is a bit of a cheat, but it's one I want to throw on there because I do think it works as a double bill. Is Star Trek Two? By this time, sure, it's Nimoy and Shatner. I can't fight you because I don't know where they were in the public standing, but I'd assume so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after Everybody the, knew him. Everybody knew him from the original series. And then, of course, Shatner had done T.J. Hooker and all these other things. I think that's around that time. But either way, they did the first movie in 80, but people know Nimoy and Shatner. People know Nimoy and Shatner. And so you're like, okay, when they come back for the second one, which is done at a way lower budget, but it's focused on their relationship, right? The whole film is about their relationship, mm -hmm. the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. Uh, Kirk's having his birthday. Spock has to go out on, they go on this training mission. They all have to go out on this training mission. Khan comes back, which is from the original series. And so it's like, okay, these two dudes got to figure this out. Yes, they have an ensemble cast. Yes, of course. Sulu, yeah, Uhura, Chekhov. Yeah. But it's really about these two dudes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Star Trek is built on Nimoy and Shatner. Yeah, eventually it becomes... Ensemble. Right, right. But it's Spock and, and it's Kirk. Yeah, even later on, but even in this McCoy iteration. isn't part of as strongly a part of the of the of the top bill as uh, uh Kirk and Spock. So yeah. So and, and as the film progresses, it's their relationship that we're exploring. It's their it's their thing and, and what have you. And so to me this counts as a double bill type of, of movie because we're following uh Spock's journey on this thing, we're following Kirk's journey on this thing, and then when they cross over Spock and Kirk are both involved in the situation emotionally uh, in all the changes that go on. And then by the end, when you have that moment in um, inside the uh, the chamber there where Spock does what he has to do to save the ship and sacrifice himself, it's one of the greatest moments ever on film, let alone Star Trek history. Film to see the kind of acting in this moment, the sparsity of the acting, the honesty of the emotion – and then the final bell at the end, the button at the end of the scene, you're just like, oh, my God. It's, it's incredible. So it is incredible. That's what I would say. <laughs> I know right. how much uh, Star Trek means to you. So it does. It does. We take about one of the best, you know, on film of all time. A lot of people will agree with you. Yeah. Uh, so it's one of the most emotionally and one of the best emotional scenes I've ever seen. All right. Uh, so then my number eight is uh, American Gangster. 
Okay, great choice. Yeah. I think uh, Russell Crowe, this is Russell Crowe and Denzel, both of them in their prime as like uh, older leading men. Apex Not, Predators. Apex Predators, yes, great They're point, both, Matt. Yeah. They're both like chomping the young guys up and spitting them exactly. out. Exactly. Oh, okay. Like two of them not circling each other. What happens? Yeah. What right? happens? This is full of some great uh, interactions between him, uh, between Russell and Denzel. Uh, really does such a great job with the film, like t- the pacing of the film. Because it's a long film. It's like, it's like two hours 20. Uh, and he does a great job pacing it out to where until they actually meet, they have to. He, has to, he does a great job establishing each of them in their own worlds mm-hmm. until they finally come together to work together at the end. But until then, you are experiencing, like you said, Matt, two alpha predators, just wa- apex predators, right, walking around in their world and oh, yeah. doing their thing. They're just circling like they're swimming. Two sharks mm-hmm. out in the ocean. They see each other. Yeah. They don't like it. They know eventually they're going to have to interact. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the interaction or oh, the uh, confrontation's coming. Yeah. yeah. I mean, R- Crows, once he specifically finds out that it's Denzel's character, he finds it out from his uh, mob buddy, because his mob buddy's yep. like, hey, you need to lay off. And he's like, who is he? Yeah. But because he's importing all that heroin, which is crazy, that to me is the most fascinating aspect of it oh, in, yeah. in its entirety, is the U.S. government was inadvertently, whatever, you know, bring it back in empty coffins. It's a terrible thing to take advantage of the it, American I mean, government look, and soldiers that died overseas. It is brilliant. On his part, it is, he got free international shipping. He did, oh, but it's terrible, mor- oh, moral it is. wise. Oh, it is. across the board, you're yeah. using coffins <coughs> to ship drugs, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is going to lead to more people in coffins. Yeah, true. so you should also invest in a coffin company because you are going to be rolling in it, my man. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're dealing in death entirely. Yeah, yeah. But the, I, how do you even think to do that? Yeah, that's crazy talk. I don't disagree with you. Um, and just uh, nobody noticed, and the system mm-hmm. went on for a long time. And What's great, too, is you got, you've got a lot of incredible actors throughout the movie, but when they come together, there's a le- there's a, you can sense a level of respect between the two guys, you know? And that's probably carried through off-camera as well. This idea that Denzel's going to do his thing, uh, Russell's going to do his thing, and they're going to find a way to mesh their acting styles in these scenes. Because even in the scenes, together, they have, they have space between each other, oh, yeah. right? Because like you need a wide berth for both these dudes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's worth it. It's such a great... It's one of these like films that no one talks about enough from Ridley Scott. I just... Because they had done so many things so well, I wanted the payoff to be better at the end. Ah, okay. So because it doesn't get... Be, the grittiness... The interesting nature of the story, yeah, the performances, yeah, yeah. it was building, building, building. To me, it fizzles out at the end. Right. It doesn't have as hard an impact. So it's always been like, it's good yeah. to me. Could have been great. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, disagree but, with you. You know, a lot of people think it's great. And that's fine. <laughs> you know, okay. I just wish I was, I was wanting something more, fair. I guess. It's What's your number me. seven? My seven is Midnight Run. Oh, uh, Groton. Okay. I'll give it to you. I don't think it's true, but I'll give really? it to okay. you. Really? Okay. I don't know that. Yeah, right. You were, yeah, okay. I fair. wasn't so yeah. to me though, Charles Grodin was basically like he was a known commodity. My parents knew who he was mm. because he was on Tonight Show and everything else and Letterman because he was such a good guest. Yes, he was. So that's that's my assumption. I think that's fair. Okay. I can see it from that point of view. So right. he existed and you knew who exactly who he was, and yeah. he also had a specific like group of friends. So the guy it's it's kind of one of those of uh, occasionally, like there's a musician that bounced around to all these different bands and yeah. whatnot, yeah. because everybody recognizes how good they are and they want to be around them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Groden to me was like, look at his who appear to be his closest friends. These are all alphas. These yeah. are all like, yeah. So that was that's what it was to me is okay. that when I saw it and I was like, hey, and it's De Niro. Yeah. So I, I clearly knew who both of them. But if you don't want to count that, no, no, that's fine. It's, I, it's your it's your list, brother man. Yeah, we always say this. I know. We I come was, up with our list. On there's the end. one that I was like, I have to cut because technically I don't think I knew who one of them was before this. Yeah. When I saw it, yeah. and I maybe vaguely knew who the other was. I had to make that cut too, and it was hard for me to make that cut, but I did it. I didn't like it. I didn't I, like it. Me either. I didn't like it. Was like, well, yeah, but it. at the same time, we're talking about the same one. Both performances were next level. Yeah. Next yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I was like, I don't know. I, I created this arbitrary definition, so I'm gonna. <laughs> so I'm gonna put Midnight Run, you yeah. know, here at number seven. That's a window into our thought process, honestly, because uh, that's the way it goes. Sometimes, once we set up an arbitrary list for ourselves, or arbitrary 
parameters for our lists, we kind of become uh, beholden to that. And some of these films that we- In our own heads. Yeah, in our own heads. Some of the films we want to put on these lists, we don't. Someone accused you the other day on Twitter of like gaming the list because you do certain things. Never happened in a million years. Yeah, yeah. We're not built that way. We'll take the hits. Both of us take the hits. I think Matt can guess sometimes what might be on my list or I can guess what might be on Matt's list, but we don't rank. I will tell you. I know because there have been shows where I I was like, trust me, I know going into this, I'm saying this right now, it's going to make it higher on- our collective yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that going into it. You're going to have that at like one. Yeah. And I still think it's in the discussion, but I think it's more like a three. Right. And you're not going to have my number one. You'll have it like four or five. Yeah. Just like, I'm going to lose that. I know I'm going to lose that. Ooh. And the poster's coming down. <laughs> I don't like that. Let me put that back up. Uh, there's a poster on the back of the door. Yeah. The masking tape does look a little, it's all sagging. <laughs> Every single piece is sagging. It's a, it's it a should sh- be time for a little more tape. the snap poster. I don't want the snap poster to come down. No way. No. So we should get it some more tape. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, or maybe a frame or something. Yeah. And uh, so Midnight Run, I mean, look, it's the height of, I think, Groden to me on some level, mm-hmm. outside of when he would panel yep. after that. I'd have to look at his you know, filmography, but I'm pretty sure this is, because after that it was like Beethoven. Like he'd show up, or and then random oh, right. things here and there, but Beethoven right. was his bread and butter, <laughs> and I didn't watch any of those. Well, that's what I'm getting at. I know. Later on. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Uh, but it, to me, Groden exists on a different level because because he was around so much, he yeah. got these shots. Like he just knew all the people. And right, that's a good point. Yes, absolutely. So he's a guy. Um, it's like uh, all the different connections that Harry Dean Stanton has. Like, oh, yeah. oh, he was best friends with such and such, right. and such and such, and such and such. And I'm like, wow, really? I never would have pegged for them for like running mates. You know, <laughs> like hanging out type of thing. That's interesting. What were they like together? Right. But it also makes me go, damn, Harry Dean Stanton, you know, I always liked you as an actor. Harry was a player, man. He was. But at the same time, there was a second, like, yeah, he was a damn good he was a character actor. Oh, yeah. He shows up in the weirdest places, too. He does. Pretty. I mean, seeing him in Pretty in Pink, I'm like, what are you doing here? The dad of Molly Ringwald. Ah, you know, I know the director. We're old buddies. <laughs> he had a small part. I just came to hang We're out. We're all drinking buddies. Yeah. <laughs> It's like three days work. I get a nice little payday. We get to hang out, see each other, and then I'm out. When he showed up in Avengers, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing in here? I know. For when, one uh, scene. Oh, was it Hulk comes yeah. down back to Earth? Yeah. Uh, For one scene. One scene. Why not? It's great. Why it's not? Harry Dean Stan. Why not? Yeah, I? if you can get Harry Dean Stan and put him in the movie, he's more than happy to show up and just do one line. I'm sure you could pay double his quote. He's, it's, a Marvel, it's Marvel money. You can double. You can pay double his quote. Easy. As, as a, just to work Easy. with him. Yeah. Well, and also to buy more goodwill in this town. You know? that, uh, true. Because a lot Very of people true. are upset with you because you're making superhero films. Yeah. So, yeah, but we're also giving tons of people paid work. Yeah. A lot of people paid work. So it's hard to you know bite the hand that feeds you. Exactly. Quit the bitching. Just enjoy mm-hmm. the movies. They're good about it. <laughs> they are. Good about it. They are. They're good about it. Uh, I was your number seven. That was my seven. My six. Mm-hmm. Not going to be on your list. Okay. Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, not on my list. Knock yes. yourself out. Go ahead. Yes. Feel free. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to put it higher. This is why the people love you, Matt, because you put these things on your list. It's not. But because we understand. <laughs> although we have, there have been a few people that have checked it over the years and be like, "Oh, I never saw it." Like basically, it was before my time type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. makes me feel spry. Oh, and uh, try being on this end. I know. It's so, okay. Listen. <laughs> Guess what waits for no man? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> 39 <eight> 29 bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the great check. Shaquille O'Neal, great philosopher Shaquille O'Neal would say. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they would say they went back and watched Dumb and Dumb and they're like, yeah, no, not for me. And It's a timing thing. It really is. But I think if that one to me is more universal than, say, Ace Ventura. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would others. say it's, it's his most... I think from that time... Uh, in his that slice of time in his period in his in his comedy career, it is the most fully realized comedy that he's done. Where he's going a hundred? Yes. yes, yes. Because the others, I think Ace Ventura Two is closer to that, like how he really wanted to do the character the first time. Mm-hmm. But the first one is a more complete movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I know yes. you don't like the second one, but I think it's got man. It's some of his moments are some of my favorites. Mm. Thank you, Dark Cotton. Good night. <laughs> Just so dumb. It's the worst. So it is the worst, but it's also the best. Oh, you chitty chitty bang bang, chitty chitty bang 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 bang, singing along. Is, I'm uh, just like, what is happening? I'm watching it. I go, what is happening? It's just pure absurdity. The <laughs> comparing the wounds. <laughs> 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 
That's the funny moment, man. Oh, there's dude, there's quite a few in that movie. Uh, quite a few? There's quite a few in that movie. I think I think I like the Bumblebee that, Tuna. Bumblebee uh, Tuna. I like that moment. The <laughs> But and I also like him wrapping the dude around his neck. You you'll not pass go. You do not collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> That's funny. That uh, was funny. Okay. Him climbing out of a rhino's ass, not funny. No, but the loogie in the face, funny. Okay. When it comes out, it's just the over. They didn't show. They just showed the aftermath. Yeah. I'm fine with that. I don't need to see them actually spitting on each other's faces. That's true. That's true. It's funnier to me. They come out and they're just. How did you get covered? Who cares? <laughs> Look at all this just comedic proportion of mucus on your face. That to me is a better punchline. It is, because otherwise it's just like a, it's it's too it's too over the top, it's too ham fisted. Fair enough. Uh, okay, that was your six. Oh so, yeah, well, keep yeah. going, keep going, man. Six. It it's a it works for me. It's an all time classic for yeah. comedy for me. Yeah. We landed on the moon. We landed on the moon. <laughs> just the the fact that they were at all times at every twist turn they tried to play it as dumb as they possibly could and yeah. never deviated from that they never got any smarter their stupidity just happened to work out for them a couple times yeah through blind sheer dumb numbers mm-hmm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. just number of times doing it uh and i think it works especially from jeff daniels perspective because jim carrey we know can do this yeah yeah and for you to come in and give an equally idiotic performance mm-hmm. fully committed that is also utterly different from Carrie's. yeah that's impressive because the, the the easier thing would just be to mimic what he's doing because he's so good at it yeah yeah, yeah. and you're not known for that and to come in with a fully just formed like that's impressive yeah yeah agreed agreed so you know there's some art in there kids <laughs> <laughs> there's some art in there some art uh all right my number seven is uh once upon a time in hollywood that is actually a punt. Okay. I wanted to put it higher. I did. I did. But I couldn't. Uh, then my number six is All the President's Men. That's a punt. Ooh. Well, well. Interesting. All right. Which number five? Or Yeah, which number five? My five is the punt from just a second ago. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All right. Let's talk about it. So good. Yeah. So yeah. good. Spoiler alert. Do we have to give that at this point? What do you want to do? Uh, I guess. Uh, How, I do you want to put a timer on it? Sure. Why not? We're not going to put a timestamp in it, but we will give you a timer. We'll tell you exactly how long we're going to go. Yeah. Um, but wait, why don't we just – don't I tell you what. Why don't we break for our sponsors right now for the audio version of this podcast. Okay. And then we'll come back and talk about this so you can decide for yourself if you want to listen in. Or do you want to wait? You want to wait after we talk about this? Uh, no, that, that makes sense to yeah. take the the time right now. It's very smart. Yep. Uh, thank you. I don't know why I just stared at you for a second. I was just trying to pull this up and process what you're saying. <laughs> no and worries. Apparently, that confused the old noggin. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's take a quick break. All right. Well, we're back. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming back and listening to the second half of this uh, Top 10 episode, the Top 10 uh, Double Build Movies. Uh, Matt, when we went to the break, you were talking about uh, well, Once Upon a ne- Time in Hollywood. We never set a timer. That's what we should have done before well, the we'll, break. We'll do it now. When we come back. How long you want to go? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Starting now. Boom. So if you haven't seen the movie, we're, we're spoiling things now for the next five minutes, possibly. Yeah. So letting you know. Uh, a, it is a true double billing. Yes, absolutely. Those two are allowed to do uh, full lead stuff sure. throughout. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've always been a sucker for both those guys. They, even even if everybody else didn't enjoy the movie as much, like, say, for, for Pitt, World War Z. Mm-hmm. I actually like that movie. Yeah, I like World War Z. Kind of, kind of a lot. I don't hate yeah. it as much as everybody else. Yeah, I understand the parts that you're talking about. Sure, and sure. It doesn't make sense in a couple parts here and there. But overall, I really think there's something there. And I do hope that Fincher does... The sequel, and it actually comes to fruition because I think there's a world there to be salvaged, just like Men in Black International. Bring back the two leads. I think you could really do something with them because they do have good chemistry. We've yep. seen it. Yep. Uh, it just didn't work out this time. It was not a good movie. Right. Um, but anyway, let go ahead. I don't want to dominate the full. No, no. Uh, I enjoyed it, too. I, uh, you know, I saw it twice. Uh, really enjoyed both Pitt's performance and DiCaprio's performance. And the fact that Tarantino kind of played a game with, uh, on the audience because for years those guys had competed with each other for the same roles. Mm-hmm. And uh, people have been clamoring for them to work together. So to have Pitt be the stunt double for DiCaprio, mm-hmm. I thought it was brilliant because yeah. that makes all the sense in the world. As much as DiCaprio could play the stunt double, he'd probably do it really well. There's an organic, um, how can I say? There's an organic uh, truth to him play to Brad Pitt. 
being the stunt double DiCaprio because Pitt doesn't take it as seriously as DiCaprio does. He's just as good. He just doesn't take it as seriously. Pitt doesn't angle for Oscars. That's DiCaprio's game. So having him play the True. actor who's desperately trying to save his career True. and stay in the top list makes sense for DiCaprio. To have Brad Pitt laid back, playing the stunt double, hoping he gets a shot to do these kind of things, that plays into Pitt's overall demeanor in a lot of his films where he's more chill, more laid back, and not as much of an active protagonist in a lot of things that are going on. So it just makes all kinds of sense in the world. So their chemistry uh, coming together lets you cheer for both guys in different ways. Very true. Yeah. Very true. And I never heard that breakdown for DiCaprio. Yeah. I like that. It yeah. makes all the sense in the world. I like that. He is my favorite part of it. Nothing against Pitt. Oh, Pitt's my favorite part. So that's funny. Okay. It's. We saw the scene in the, the trailer when the little girl tells him. Yeah. Oh, my God. It is even more effective. And you know it's mm -hmm. fucking coming. But when she sells it like his, like, you're goddamn right. <laughs> that even thing. I was like, oh, my God. I knew that was coming, and that was even better than I hoped it would be. You are acting the living shit out of yeah. this failing actor part. Yep. It's so good. Like, in those moments, because Pitt is just calm, cool, collected. Yeah, yeah. And it's great to watch. Yeah. You know? Uh, he's a high-performance, like, car. Yep. Just driving at 80 miles an hour, perfect. Because that's what's required of him in the road. Well, it is. So it, it is. just makes all the sense of the world. Yeah. yeah. Fast, but smooth and steady. Yeah. If yeah. that makes any kind of sense. Absolutely. But he does later when the, the, the you know, fucking Helter Skelter kids come in, mm -hmm. and he's just like, boom, dog, bam, coming in. But when he walks out, I knew the flamethrower was coming, I guess, <laughs> the first time. But I still was like, oh, my God, flamethrower. Oh, I was so excited. He's never caught out. Which is what I like about Pitt's performance. No matter okay. what situation he's in, he's yeah. always in command. He's yeah. never like... At camp? Yeah, right. Whereas DiCaprio at times is like frustrated and, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, one of the greatest scenes in the movie is when he's like messes up his line and goes into the trailer, destroys the trailer and comes back out oh, and yeah. kind of nails it. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Just flat out like lost it. Broken down. And it makes sense, man. We, you totally. know, especially... Uh, um, totally. I remember one time I was uh, shooting a commercial. And I'm sure this happened to you, especially mm -hmm. like on Wind Talkers, where you have the, the the abstract thought of, I wonder how many millions of people will end up seeing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you it's like, well, I can't think about that. And it doesn't make me nervous. It does in that moment. Like things like, mm -hmm. that's kind of crazy. The sheer numbers of people that are either passively or actively going to watch me right. do this, whatever it is, is absurd. Yeah. Uh, and then move about my day. Just <laughs> <laughs> Get it together! <laughs> But the the pit at the camp. Oh, the pit at the camp. My so oh, when yeah. he just clobbers that dude, takes him out, right? Yeah. That to me is the essence of the stupid question of uh, field of like twelve year olds. How many how many do you think you could beat up before they <laughs> overtook you? Type of thing. And that one, like, so he took out the whoever was charging. Luckily, is it Taylor Kitsch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's out, out on a horse. Right. That guy would definitely, like, he would put up a fight. Yeah, but he that's takes him best. out anyway later on. He does. So, But the one dude he just crushes. Yeah, he does. And but that, that's that's why you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that stops everybody behind, yeah, though. Yeah. There's 20. You got numbers. You can take them. But if that dude was your best option in this current moment. Yeah. Um, well, all right, yeah. so there's our five minutes. There's our five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. We it both is. liked it. It's on our list. <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of Pitt, my number five is uh, Fight Club. Uh, you're fi that's a punt. Wow! Yeah. I am so curious now to see what you have in these top four. Well, four was all the president's men for me. Well, okay, so we're moving on to your four because, like, you said we got to punt Fight Club, right? Yeah. Okay, so four, yeah. all the president's men. Well, that's men. the punt from you from yes. was yeah. it six? My number six, yes. Six, yeah. At least we got some commonality on this team. Yeah, we do, and it's it's not far off from one another. These two guys were big, big, big in the seventies. Hoffman and Redford, two and different reasons. This is a huge movie because everybody yes. knows this story, Water so you games. better pull this off. Yep, and they really do. Yeah, I mean, a great like Woodward and Bernstein, just great names that roll off the tongue, like Redford and Hoffman, or Hoffman and Redford. I don't know if Dustin's listening and watching. He wants to put his name first. I know that he's got that kind of ego. It's fine. Um, but yeah. And Redford is so seemingly cool. He's so like, whatever. I run against the two. That's why I always liked Pitt. He seems the exact same type. When they still work oh, together, yeah. I was like, makes all the sense in the world. Pitt's like, whatever. I don't care. Yep. My life is pretty fucking solid. And to me, like, it's McQueen to Redford to Pitt. That's yeah. the connection. They're all essentially the same kind of uh, actors. You ever thought about that? Like how singularly I tried to write a joke about this I could never mm. I could never get it but how singular unique a person like that's life is mm -hmm. like it, 
Maybe more so for DiCaprio because he got the run earlier because Pitt had to come out here and he was in random things for like oh yeah for years. Growing Pains, I think. Oh no, DiCaprio was in Growing Pains. Though, so one uh, of those guys. Yeah, yeah. That's what vaulted him. But yeah, uh, I think although Pitt made a one episode or two episode on Growing Pains. He, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, maybe he did. Dated or Tracy Ties? Gold or something. Or was, it, was it Tracy Gold? Okay, I think so. All right, I think you might be right on that one. Fair enough. DiCaprio is known well, for that. Let's take a look here while you're talking. But uh, like he had a failed pilot that only had or a failed show. There's like six episodes or something, and right. he was on this, and then Thelma and Louise's introduction. That's when people knew who Pitt was, like discovered well, who Pitt uh, was. Went, who the hell is this? Yeah, who's Not guy? even discover. We haven't hit pay dirt just yet. Because <laughs> he didn't get quite a shot until like two, three years after that. Right. He had to work up his bona fides a little bit, but he got better you know, projects thereafter type of thing. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, 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 he was on 21 Jump Street, Dallas, head of the class. Oh, yeah. He was, uh, was it her name? Simone's boyfriend or yeah, something Simone's like that? Simone's boyfriend. Two separate Growing Pains episodes not playing the same character. <laughs> two years apart. I'll be damned. It sounds like 70s sitcom stuff. Then he was on something called Glory Days, which I have no, I don't remember anything about I think Glory that's the Days. failed show. Oh, wait, that might have been it then. That only went X number of yeah. episodes. Spike, some guy named Spike Yeah, it's, it's a bunch of random. But yeah, at the same okay. time, you know, yeah, probably had all the confidence in the world because he's always been able to get the girl and people yeah. are always nice to him because he's so handsome. And then yeah. you make more money when you're that good looking just yep. by default. Like yep. if you look at the numbers... The better looking you are, on average, the way more money you make. Your life is better. It's easier. So just if you are the 1% of that 1% and yeah. you're Brad Pitt, like, how, what, what is your life like? Like, I don't even understand. I can't process. When other famous people say that dude's actually famous. Yeah. That dude's famous. That dude's famous. Yeah. Like, we're all in the fame business and everybody knows my name and my face. But if we walk into a room, they all run to you first. Every single one no. of them. No. Well, that's what Clooney would say, uh, him and Damon after Ocean's Eleven. Oh, right, yeah. When they found out who was really famous because Pitt would go out and the paparazzi would just swarm him. And I think it was Clooney who was like, and then basically they'd almost be done with the role of film. They'd come over and just get a couple of me and Damon. <laughs> <laughs> and they're done. <laughs> just, but when you see that, you see like we're all movie stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all making obscene money. We yeah. all live in Hollywood and Malibu and all that. Yeah. But yeah. this other weird uh, – and on some level, I guess they would be envious, but mostly not. Yeah, true. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that bullshit. DiCaprio was in Poison Ivy, that Drew Barrymore film from 92. Was he really? Yeah, he had a small part called Guy. His name is Guy in the film. He was in Critters 3. Parenthood was the series he was on as well. Uh, he did do Growing Pains, right? Yeah. But then he was on Roseanne, uncredited as Darlene's classmates. He was probably an extra in that damn show probably and in the new lassie in 1989 i'm actually surprised he ended up being as handsome as he did that's a fair point when he was younger uh-huh because those eyes didn't really fit his head at that point it didn't I'm if you go back you, and look at growing I'm, pains i'm gonna let you tell him that he grew into it dude yeah. dude's a handsome guy yeah yeah like yeah. ridiculously there's a reason that six models are always with him willing to bone at all times <sighs> he is just <laughs> next level dude he is yeah he's got that smoothness he doesn't have to do the uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, the ridiculously named guy uh, that dated Michelle Pfeiffer and dated uh, oh Fisher Stevens. There you go, Fisher yeah, Stevens. Yeah, Fisher Stevens. Like that dude behind the scenes must have all the confidence in the world. And, yeah. What do they call that? There's a word. There's a term for that. Boatman. Oh. He's a boatman. Uh, yeah. A boatman? You mean uh, boatman. well, pipe man is what I think uh, Rappaport says. Oh, I don't. Yeah, Rappaport's dangerous to follow. follow oh, I don't follow. I just he's popped up on certain things I've heard over the years every once and again. I think it's called Boatman, isn't it? Am I wrong on this, boys, people? I don't know. I don't know. No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. What is Boatman? Boatman is uh, the neighbor that runs the little boat gang. He's very fond of cars and computers and allergic to condoms. Okay, maybe he is the Boatman. All right. Sure. All right, fair enough. I, there, there's something I can't remember the term for it though. But anyway, let's move on because I don't want to get in trouble on the show. Uh, all right, that's your number five. That was my four. Four. All the presidents. Do okay. Yeah. So Watergate. <laughs> ben Bradley. Uh, yeah, deep throat. Deep throat. Um, Nixon. The, yeah. The uh, <laughs> you know it reminds me <laughs> on some level of other things I may hypothetically have seen at some point. I'm not sure when. My memory escapes me. But yeah. 
Uh, in 20 years, we may see another. We might see a remake of this. I don't think so. <laughs> There's no way they let that happen. Uh, the way they're lying to themselves about a million other things. No way they let that happen. Yeah, you know, there'll be movies will be made. <sighs> movies will be. I'm made. sure movies will be made. Movies are made about W. Uh, so yeah. I mean, there was already a. You know, Fox News TV show that was really good, and now there's a Fox News movie that's coming. It's supposed, supposed to be really good. Yeah. Did you like the Fox News TV show? Yeah, I thought it was great. What was uh, Voice in the Room? What is it called? Shout in the Room? Uh, loudest Voice in the Loudest room. Voice in the Room. It's good, huh? Russell Crowe is great. Okay. I can't get past the makeup. Oh, okay. S- Never Snyder- bothered me once. I was just like, okay, Damn. this is what he's doing. Fine. Snyder and Shannon both tell me to watch this thing. This is incredible. Said, You're a political junkie. This is totally up your alley. But I am just I can't get past the makeup. Maybe I just got to sit down. It's super interesting. Oh, maybe I'll download them for Australia. And yeah, I'll for watch the trip. Yeah, yeah, for the trip. It's a 15-hour ride. Might as well watch something. Um, yeah, uh, this is such great work from Hoffman, too, and Redford. And, you know, you can tell Hoffman got his, has his style, his manic style, right? And very determined style to, like, essentially browbeat people. And, and Redford's more smoother. It's a good cop, bad cop, essentially. Because mm-hmm. to Hoffman, it seems so damn logical everything he wants to do. Whereas Redford is more like, no, dude, you got to understand. Well, there's a way to do this. Right. There's a way to do this. It makes sense, Mm -hmm. but there's a way to do this, right? And when when they find their moments uh, where Jason Robards is like putting their, like out on the front yard, when Robards is like, you guys got to get this right or you're fucked. You're basically fucked. And so it's like, oh shit. Because you forget how close they came to losing the story. How close, and it's funny to watch the old clips because you don't, you don't remember this, but like of Republicans coming out saying the same thing that they kind of saying now and not trying to get political, but kind of what they're saying now with, with Trump. Well, it's like, oh, this is a witch hunt. This is wrong. Yeah. You shouldn't come after this guy. It's a nothing story. They're trying to protect their power. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who's in power at that time, they're trying to protect their power. Yeah, so yeah. if it's a Democrat, a Republican, a Whig, or what have you. Yeah, a Whig. Like, whatever the version is. I do think we need to move off a two-party system. Oh, here we go. All of a sudden, we slid into this. Well, yeah. just to be more representative of, because I just, the binary of one or the other mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. Okay. Especially now that we all can subdivide societally to all these little niches. Oh, that's a fair point. It's how do these two standard bearers right. represent now this wide, vast right. array. Right. People of color, LGBTQ community. I know. Right? But there's the same it's time, a fair point. It is, but I, I don't know how you govern like that, too. We have to have go to make through. coalition. Then yeah. we, we'll pass even less. Yeah, I, that's how we used to be back at the beginning of the start of the country. I, I just think it'd be so contentious then. We're never going to... I think this con- current Congress is like the, the least productive mm-hmm. in the history of... But yeah. They say that every... They do. This is great. This is nothing. Nothing's getting through. And you're like, I mean... There are still deals being made. Yeah, of course. Things are. are still happening. It's not like they're all sitting around, you know, f- fucking playing games on their, you know, phones or whatever. I'm sure digits. they're happening. <laughs> Every once again, I couldn't think of any like stupid hot whatever Angry Birds, Angry Birds version yeah. is, but that doesn't. No. Not like it did. I can't play phone uh, games on my phone anymore. I can see people do it in, in um, on planes or in restaurants or okay. just sitting around and I'm just going, wow. I would rather be on Twitter reading an article. So to me, it's weird to see people playing games. I play Risk. You do. Yeah. Okay. And Do you play against a computer? Yeah, because the the problem is if you play against people, it takes too long. Oh, yeah. Because you, you have an, a counter for every person's move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by and large, everybody goes to the full counter. So whatever it is, and like a game takes forever. I'm sure. Whereas if it's just computer, you can fast forward. But the competition's not as hard. But it's just like something to pass. Mm-hmm. I try and make it harder and harder for myself. Right. To try and figure out the, you know. That makes sense. I do other games, but it's kind of limited. I play a game called Free Cell. I used to do oh, Mahjong, but I don't do that anymore. Okay. What are you, uh, old, old grandma playing Mahjong? It's pattern recognition. It's, <laughs> you know, damage. you're just using your mind in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Instead of just passively. I read all the articles. I do all that, but my brain needs a break from that, too. I understand. My girlfriend loves playing the crossword puzzle. She's discovered an app on the oh, okay. the Galaxy Note. She she was addicted to that shit for like three weeks. Like, she was playing constantly. Oh, I used to play... Words with friends. Oh yeah, words with friends was like, I had to wean myself off of that. I uh, I would uh, basically was I had three regular games where we were playing a game at all times, mm-hmm. and then I had other randoms people that yeah, would, yeah. you know play Match whatever up. else. But uh, yeah, with the three, it's whoever won they start the next game, yeah. and then you just start over, and everybody was on top of it, just yeah. constant. Like I was playing that all the time. For me, I had ten people I was playing constant on words with friends, like. Constant rotation okay. or eight. I think it's eight, eight to ten. So or you had to weed out. Like, however much you're allowed to do it, but 
it was like chasing gambling, Matt. It's like every time I'd lose it back, like, start a game. Start a game. You know, it was like that chasing thing. And I, one person beat me all the time. Like she's she's a editor for a See, I'm fine with magazine. That. I so had I one like, I slowly whittled away the people that I knew were cheating. Oh. <laughs> so I got I down didn't to see that people would cheat on a game like that. Oh, oh fuck wow. yeah. I got a buddy. Look, he's really? he's all well and good. He's a he's a fantastic guy. <laughs> Solid as can be. And he is he is smart. I yeah. will give him that. I'm not saying all he's right. dumb. All right. But he would drop words and I would have to look it up and be like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know the moment in mitosis yeah. when this actual chemical bond is being broken. That's called this. Way to get 64 points. Right. Fuck you. You look that. You use a, a website or something and gave them all your letters and they spit out and you figured out what the best would work out for you. Right, right, right. Bullshit. I played him for a long time because he only did it every once and again. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like your record is unfaithful. Like you have an extra 10% wins. Because I know you've cheated on yeah. specific games. Yeah, yeah, For yeah. a fact, I'm not playing with you anymore. <laughs> so I got down to like three. Three people I knew were not cheating. <laughs> if you win, you win. If I win, I win. It's just like I'm just here to right. try and you know have fun, use my brain. That's fair. Anyway, all the president's men. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Uh, what uh, you got? Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid is my number four. Oh, that's a punt. Wow. So what do you got at the what top the of your fuck? list? We're gonna have a nice battle of this. All right, what's your number three? Yeah, what on my list did you take that mm. I didn't? Uh, my number three is Fight Club. Okay. Because they were both solidly. So from yes, Primal they Fear, were. Absolutely. I knew Ed Norton. Mm -hmm. And Pitt had been around for a while yep. when Fight Club came out. So they were both top of the line, yeah, you know. definitely. Advertised individuals. Did you see, uh, did you listen to Norton's interview with Pitt, with uh, Bill Simmons yet? Uh, kind of in the background. I think oh, okay. it's something else. Okay. I heard... Most of it, but there were moments it was like I, I don't know how long that was, and I was yeah. so laser focused on this. Pitt said, Pitt said uh, to Norton, mm. right? He, yeah, at the back got, of the theater. Yeah, if you guys haven't listened to it yet, I would definitely recommend listening to the interview Norton has with Bill Simmons because he says that to him. He says that Pitt said to him after they finished watching Fight Club in the back of the theater, "Well, this is a film that we're both like we might never do a film this good again." Is what he basically said. It's that good, mm. you know. We'll be proud to be part of this film going forward. And this is this film still holds up, still works. It's multi, it's generational, absolutely, because it's about this idea of what is manhood, what isn't. This idea True. of being a slave to materialism versus mm -hmm. who you really are. Are you losing your connection to your primal nature as a cre as a as a mammal born from Neanderthals? You yeah, know, or, or you know what I'm saying. Well, Evolved. What, what do you want from life? But what do you think life is? Yeah, and what defines things. you? And what defines mm -hmm. you? You know, ultimately. Yeah. It's it's one of those – it's so slick. It's so stylized. It's so specifically itself mm. that on some level I wanted it to kind of fail. Yeah. It's like you're oh. just – you know. Right. Like no. And I because I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it mm. when it had been out on DVD for a while because I was hesitant. Mm. Even though I liked Pitt so much, it just seemed too slick, too – we're trying to make a bro movie and we know all the elements. Right. And then I saw it and I was like, I don't think bros will understand what this is actually <laughs> talking about. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Yep. And you have to have the bros like Tyler Durden who is this flamboyantly wild character. That's who they're trying to identify with. Right. Ultimately, he's a schizophrenic figment of another man's imagination. Right. That shot through the back of the – you know, when he goes yeah. down and he's still alive afterwards. Oh, my God. Did you know that's down in uh, uh, Nakatomi Plaza area? Oh, really? The, where they shot that? Makes sense. It does. And that yeah. weird, all of a sudden, Avenue of Stars. Oh, just yeah. Five buildings out of nowhere. These huge skyscrapers. Yeah, in Century City, yeah. Yeah. And just and then nothing. Nothing around it. It's such it's a true. weird, out of nowhere, boom. And then it's like, oh, Nakatomi Plaza. It's right at the top of a hill, too. Like, yeah. you, you, when you go Olympic, you're going up. To get to that area. Yeah. Oh, no. Is it a I thought it was Pico and Wilshire. Mm. Isn't it between those two? Well, no. Pico, uh, Olympic is it? Pico's oh, yeah. below Olympic. That's, you're so, right. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Olympic's there. And then, uh, yeah, Wilshire. Wilshire. Wilshire, right. Wilshire is the other thing. That's, that's how I went. I've been, I had to stop there a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. At a, somebody's something or other. That's where they're doing Ford versus Ferrari tonight. I might go. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, those those uh, it's random. But like this film, also the st the relationship he has with uh, ooh, Helena Bonham character, Helena, Helena Bonham Carter's character, uh, is fantastic as well because she's kind of this 
stereotypical, like kind of messed up girl going from place to place. Mm -hmm. But then what she's doing by is slowly exposing him and making him take a look. So it's when she comes into his life that Durden becomes an even stronger part because to create this like completely new person to try to counteract what's happening with him and Helena Bonham Carter, right? And he has, True. He has because he doesn't have the confidence to get a woman like this, but Tyler Durden does. And so he becomes that character to get her. Yeah. But she thinks she's still with this guy who has these two sides to him. And it isn't until like the... Thing, uh, near the end there that she realizes what the hell is going on well it just makes her acting even even better oh, when you yeah. go back to watch it the later times mm -hmm. when she's like who are you right now yeah the first time you saw that you're like why are you being a bitch <laughs> <laughs> like but you know it's not even it has nothing to do with you being a woman right or anything else fine why are you being a dick like yeah. why are you why are you cranky pants all yeah. of a sudden yeah, yeah, yeah and then afterwards you see the second time you're like yeah but that would be weird Hanging out with one person and then just 180 degrees the other. Yeah. What's her name again in the movie? Um, yeah, I'm not in Schmodown shape right now. You can clearly tell. It's not Mona. No. No? Shoot. Right? What is her name in the movie? <laughs> Darla. Darla. Yeah. I was in, it's I in there. I knew it was an A. It ended with an A, but I was like, Darla, Angela, right. Krista. Mona. <laughs> yeah, Mona. I knew it was an A. You were right on that. It's like, oh, what was it? I wouldn't have been able to pull that Oof. of Every, all the names in the world. Every once in a while, the slide's in there. Um, yeah, such a good movie. And uh, Chuck Palahniuk did the uh, book. You should read the book. Um, and I, I think what you said, Matt, is actually pretty astute. The idea that it's like it's about – it's criticizing bro culture, but the bros who need to be – seeing this film won't get it no it's brilliant in that way it's just it's toxic masculinity it and actually the absence of it as well mm -hmm. he once he finds the balance at the end it's finding that balance mm -hmm. right that you that he's 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 searching for that's why yeah. he feels out of place because he's got these two warring sides of him and he can't find any peace so he's constantly out of place the whole time in the movie until the end uh all right what are we at that was your three my three is unforgiven Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman. Do you count Morgan Freeman's are part you, as big enough as a co-lead? What's the big enough thing you're talking about? They go on the adventure together. He literally is there from the beginning. Yeah, but... All right, fine. I'll the, put Hackman up there. Fine. The most, it still works. Yeah, but then it makes a three-person type no, of no, thing. No, no. I well, could just Hackman, Hackman doesn't come Eastwood. in until basically, uh, you know, Morgan Freeman's almost done. Ned. What? Hackman's in there from the beginning. I mean, kind of. What are you talking about? The first I mean, scene is kinda. him. The first scene is him coming in Look, and going after the thing. So I will say Eastwood Hackman. That works for me. Okay. Even if you relegate Morgan to a, a small. I, I, I just thought of it through the guise of Morgan. I'm like, I don't know. He's it's he's gone for basically the the biggest scene in the movie to me. Morgan. You mean the end? Yeah. No, because he's been killed. Exactly, but. His journey's over. I don't know what you're saying. Well, look, Pitt's killed out of that uh, last scene as well. Last scene. Notice yeah. that that specific, very specific descriptor well, you used there. Well, that's there in the coffin. Oh, that does not count. <laughs> and you think that was actually Morgan Freeman? No, of course not. So he was not there. So I say Hackman. That's fine. Hackman Eastwood. They definitely were the selling points of this movie. Villain and uh, good guy. I was essentially anti-hero, kind of. Uh, but yeah, those are the two dudes. You could definitely... That was the... bill. I mean, Hackman was huge. At the time, so was Eastwood with doing this thing in 92. I mean, ha Hackman is, what, three years away from Hoosiers? So he is massive. People know him. Is that all it is? Yeah. Is it 89? Hoosiers 89? I'm pretty sure Hoosiers. Oh, maybe it's 86. Is it 86? I, 86, sorry, 86 87. You're right. I'm sorry. 86. I was going to say, it's like, wow, three years? Because I'd, I'd known Hackman for a long time, I felt, like oh, by go. the time Unforgiven came out. I don't know. He is. Yeah? To me, French it's just, Connection and all that stuff? Yeah, but it's an Eastwood film. Mm -hmm. And these other guys are playing two big parts in it, but it's an Eastwood film. No. No. Okay. Because they're both, because I mean, at the beginning, it's Hackman showing up when those cowboys cut that woman up, and then he's the one beating up Richard Harris. See, his all his scenes don't have to do with Eastwood until Eastwood shows up in that town. That's not an hour into the movie. So, like, Hackman is having his own narrative, his own journey here, trying to build that house, dealing with his dudes in the You're town. You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. I just never – I've always viewed it as an Eastwood movie. 
because uh, it's him as of course he wrote and directed wrote of directed won the Oscar acted the lead Oscar. yeah exactly yeah. it's always been like a, now this was always his baby this wasn't a double build to it, me but without Hackman there is no that film doesn't work he's such of a course great, it doesn't such a great uh, uh, villain as a little Bill so I mean I'm just saying I, you're right. So, You're right. You're not wrong. 1992 I'm just best telling picture. Telling you how my loopy brain works. <laughs> I respect it. I respect so, it. So, uh, I, I love the movie. It still holds up. Still, still. Uh, I, what do we put? Number one or number two on our greatest westerns ever that we've done? It's one. It's always yeah, it's one. Always one. Right. It's yeah. always one. It's yeah. ironic too because it's right at the dying last breaths of westerns. Uh, was Unforgiven. But it's the deconstruction. Yeah. It's, it's everything. Mm-hmm. It's everything. Yeah. It really is. The Here's story. all the myths that you always believed altruistically of. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, if there were some gunslingers out there dealing justice, you'd be like, mm, if you deal in death, sometimes you're in the right, sometimes you're in the wrong. Right, exactly. So and, and That's why I love that ending when the writer asks him and he says, uh, how did you go about killing who in, in order? And he was because uh, yeah. what's that all about? He goes, well, the experienced gunman who walks in and he's like, is that right? I didn't even think about it, to be honest. I always just had luck killing people. Oh, yeah. That's what he just said. I got, I, was, I got lucky on yeah. this guy and this guy. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, because to me, that's his shot at critics. Okay. That's his shot at anybody who is like thinking they know how to do something when they've never done it. Right? I think that's all because he makes him a writer, makes him piss his pants the second he's confronted with a gun. Saul Rubinick is the actor who plays that part. And you have him do – and when he confronts him at the end, he's essentially, I think, shitting on movie critics or critics of anything. He's saying like – because he's like, oh, no, I, uh, I've read here that you need to do this. You need to do that. You're supposed to do this. He's like, I didn't do any of that bullshit. I just went in and figured it uh, just mm-hmm. instinct and boom. And luck. And luck. Right. Exactly. He's very clear about that, uh, which people talk about all the time. Directors always mention happy accidents. Um, all right. Uh, what's your number two? Two is probably not on your list. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Oh, my God. All right. No, no, I am t- take it away. It's a good choice. Connery is massive at this time. And he is double bill. He is. On the heels of Untouchables. And Wait, I was waiting with bated breath when this came out because I already loved Indiana Jones. Sure. But the lead up to it was like him plus Sean Connery. Mind, little kid, blown. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, man. I love this movie. I've loved it since the first day. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's the best. Let's get back to the Middle East. Let's get back to... <laughs> Give me the Templars. The Knights of the Templars. Give me yeah, everything that I enjoyed about the first one. The second one, you know, it's got its moments, <sighs> but it also has got its misses. Really big misses. But I can still watch it. Um, I just don't enjoy it as much. So I don't watch it as often. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But every once in a while, it's just like, I've seen the others a lot. Let me watch Temple of Doom again. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, cleanses that palate. And I yes. go right back to, you know what I really want to watch is, you know, <laughs> Last Crusade again. <laughs> I, I, it's just the perfect tete on tete between the two of them. The father son dynamic mm-hmm. and the maturation of both within basically the expression and growth of their love between the two characters. Yeah. Started out and it was still one versus two. And it yeah. was always, you know, from a position of dominance and lesser just because of circumstances, the way things are supposed to have been, yeah. I guess, or at least uh, perceived. And eventually it became an even ground between the two of them mm-hmm. where they could probably speak truth to one another. Right. And say what needed to be said. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really, I mean, just to have that counterpart, it's, it makes me wish then he had more of that in the first one, even though he kind of does, but it's more indie solo. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this was always, this is my favorite of the indie series. I, I mean, it's a, such a neck and neck. I know you're the other side. I am. Raiders is, and there's nothing wrong with that choice. Right, right, right. No, I only, only because they kind of undercut, uh... Denholm Elliott's character, that guy, their friend, the British dude who's like the... Oh, make him an idiot? Yeah, they make him an idiot. When he's not an idiot in the first movie. So no. it makes no sense to make him an idiot in the okay. third one. I get it's for comic relief, of it course. Is. And of course, you can fall back on this idea that's based on those old school serials that had people act foolishly at certain moments. I get that. But for me, you know, Raiders is a more complete film. Although you could argue Raiders as well, which we did, I think, when we talk about it. Uh, and I certainly do it on the cinephiles, this idea that Raiders uh, kind of undercuts Marion Ravenwood as well. You present her as this hard-drinking, punching, take-no-crap kind of woman, and then you turn her into a damsel in distress for the second half of the movie. It's super frustrating to watch now in 2019 eyes because you're like, no, she could have had way more to do with what was happening yeah. rather than stumbling into situations and falling down pits and but- put on the white dress, all that kind of crap. Yeah. And they didn't remedy it in uh, Crystal Skull either, so. No, no, not at all. Not no. at all. But I don't really count that movie. Yeah, nobody should. So. I don't care. I, I, let me ask you something, man. I want to ask you an honest question. 
I'm so – do you get – and then maybe I shouldn't, but I get fr- super frustrated when I see these articles from sites where people are defending terrible movies. And they go, oh, no, this is not as bad as you think it was. And it's like – I get that you're getting – is it for clicks? Is that what it's all about? People are trying well, to defend the Crystal Skull and say – But it could be one think. person in their office or, Star Trek or wherever they're or at their house or whatnot yeah. genuinely believes this. And they're just calling out hoping that more people are in agreement. That's all it is. It's fucking, yeah. You're throwing out life preservers hoping that you're not the only one marooned out here. <laughs> <laughs> the internet just can frustrates me slowly it, bring you together. Because now, according to just about every numerous every site that's ever existed uh, talk, talk, that talks about movies, there was at least one article about one movie that everybody universally hated, but there's some writer defending it. So then there's no way to quantify a terrible movie that is universally uh, f- because Nothing's hated. Nothing's going to be universally hated or yeah. loved. Nothing. Yes, that's a fair point. Nothing. What about music? There's a terrible artist, isn't there? Doesn't matter. Nothing. Nothing is universally loved or hated. Like I've said to you before, somebody out there, and I'm guessing there are a lot of somebody's, hated Mother Teresa. Hated her. (laughs) A slumlord in Calcutta thought that woman was the devil and was messing up all his... Who does she think she is? Exactly. There were probably (laughs) numerous slumlords and businesses in those slums and whatnot that she helped put the kibosh on. That's fair. And those guys were like, fuck you, Teresa. (laughs) Mata. Fuck you, Mata. Oh, you're a saint. You didn't know her. All right? (laughs) You didn't didn't know her. You had no idea. You saint my ass. You don't always like to deal with her. Exactly. Somebody hated Mother Teresa. That's fair. That's fair. And by all accounts, all she did was help poor, destitute... Yeah, it's it. That's all yeah, she did. Let's give them point. a certain level of quality of life that we take for granted. So you're telling me there's someone out there who will defend Russell Crowe singing in Les Miserables, is what you're saying? Yes. Wow. Because they like that off, you can tell it's a man. You know what I mean? He doesn't often sing, but he's moved to song. Like you can justify it however you want to. I'm, I'm okay with things being subjective. I've been one of the biggest trumpeters of that. But I also think there's things that can be universally hated and felt like – and you can feel that are not good. And when I see these sites that try to defend, oh, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is not as bad as you think it is. Vanilla Ice's song is not as bad as you think it is. And I'm just like, I, loved I it want to time. bang my head to a wall. I loved it at the time. And I loved the movie at the time. Yeah. But it was at the time. All right. So I'm someone's going to defend Ishtar. Someone's going to defend yeah. Heaven's Gate. 100%. 100%. doesn't wow. matter what it is. People defend Plan 9. People defend The Room. Oh, right. True. The Room. People do defend The Room. Yeah. Scott Menzel was on Movie Talk this morning, and he was defending the second Fantastic Beasts movie. And I, I didn't know that person existed who liked that film. After the turd that was the first one, I fell asleep uh, watching the second one on the plane. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that's yeah, it's what you're supposed to do because it's boring and it's terrible. It was. The I didn't care about okay. the first one. Oh, no. The second guy's terrible. First one's got flaws galore for oh, me. Sure. Flaws, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's... But it's charming. The love story's charming between Queenie and... But his friend and the, the other uh, yeah. woman, they were way better. They oh, had way they more chemistry. Fa- absolutely agree. They were the best part of the movie. Absolutely agree. And it was the tiniest part. Yeah. The whole newspaper angle, the, yeah. no payoff. Yeah. Oh, no payoff. Oh, that's a fair point. Nothing. It goes nowhere. So why yeah. even bring it up? It has yeah. no point in the story. doesn't move any storyline along. doesn't flesh out any characters. It's right. just dumb. Yeah. It's like that over and over, and you see these fucking mystical beasts, and you're like, yeah, but I don't care. That's the problem. It's Harry Potter. And I don't want to find them. I want to enjoy these this because beasts. everything else in this world I have enjoyed. Yeah. Either a you know, decent amount to whatever, the earlier versions, mm-hmm. like uh, mm-hmm. what is it, Philosopher's Stone, the first one? Yes. Or Sorcerer's uh, Stone, depending on which, Stone. Where, which uh, whatever it what a continent you are when you get the book. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. I get it. I see why it's a kid's movie. And when and as it grows and yeah. the themes become more mature, it's like, this is really good. Yeah. Even Fantastic Beasts came out. It's like, nope. <laughs> All right. What was your number two? Which is, yeah. what, which is what? Last Crusade. Last Indiana Crusade. Jones and Last Crusade. All right. My number two is Heat. Now, how is this? is an ensemble to me. What? Because of Val Kilmer. No, De Niro dude. spends more time if as Morgan a binary Freeman star. Morgan Freeman is not part of the conversation than Niro's Kilmer. Kilmer's not even... Okay, but they only intertwine twice. Right, but they're the people... They're above the headline. Heat, it's De Niro, Pacino. They are double... You're right. It ain't Kilmer up there. You're right. I was just thinking of it, like, actually on screen. It's two dudes coming in, and everybody else is... They may be an ensemble, like Ford versus Ferrari. But... Oh, yeah. Who's... There might be somebody there. Oh, you got Barenthal. I know he's in it. I don't think he counts. Well, he's playing Lee Iacocca. This is interesting. That's an interesting choice. I don't remember Lee Iacocca like an this. I only know him as an old man. So I don't know. Yeah. 
60s Iacocca or 50s, whatever, but I think the 60s yeah. is You're not. You're right, Josh Lucas, uh, John Bernthal. These are not names that go above the title necessarily. So. No, so these are just. Yeah. Whereas right. you got Val Kilmer, you got. Let me see the heat. Yeah, Henry Rollins. It's always above the bill. <laughs> 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 yeah, nobody. Uh, John Voight, but not in this movie. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, I think he's on the poster. He is. Kilmer's on the poster. Kilmer's on the poster. And he's third biggest. He's right. got a prominent. It's not like Sizemore's got a huge <sighs> placement. Or yeah, see, there it is. Yeah, so. way at the bottom is Kilmer. Okay, but, but is that the bottom? Build. It's triple build. It's not even triple build. There's right three the billings. That's There's three two. billings right there. Top. That's three. Look at that. Notice top. you can't even crop out Val Kilmer. Third you, billing you right you there. Could. That's three. You can. You can plus size that. Sure, you can cheat. Uh, <laughs> But he's like down there at the bottom. That's a triple bill. Yes, but three names and three names alone are listed on the front of this poster. Where was he at at the time? I don't think he was a name at the time in terms okay, of. Okay, well, now it's you justifying. It's literally. Well, of course, we all have to justify our decisions. I mean, the show is called Double Build. <laughs> they were both double build. It's eating. It's no one's going. Oh, I got to go see Kilmer in this movie. I don't People care. People are going. That's a triple Niro. billing. That no. is a triple billing. No way. No way. Find me another. Movie poster of any of the movies that we discuss where they list three names on the front. What are the other ones you've had? Uh, King Speech, Nice Guys, Dumb and Dumber, Midnight Run, Fight Club, Once Upon a Time, Plain, uh, Planes, Trains. Well, Midnight Run is like, if you, I take heat if you get to get Midnight Run because nobody knew Charles Gordon for fuck's sake other than just a guest on a show. No one's running out seeing Charles Gordon movies. Well, that's also much lower on my list. <laughs> now, now who's rationalizing? No. And two... On the front of Midnight Run, it is De Niro and it's Charles Grodin, and it's their names. And that's it. It's because no one else is in the movie. Joe Pants. Yafet Coda. You're not putting Yafet Coda or Joey Pants. Joey Pants. On the front of the movie. On the Dorfarina. You're not putting, they're all character actors. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. That just happens to be what this movie, you know, story is. There's only two real characters, and they are double build on the movie poster as opposed to triple build. With a third actor. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to tell me Heat doesn't qualify in your mind. Heat. Uh, it's not It's not a De Niro Pacino film. You think it's a De Niro Pacino Kilmer film? You really do in your mind? Under the definition. I didn't write any of my side I'm list. asking you a question. In my side list of potentials that I sent you, Heat is not listed. I know it's not listed. I already That's had this conversation mistake. in my head. Go ahead. You think, it's a, you think it's De Niro Pacino and Kilmer movie? You don't think it's a De Niro Pacino movie? I think I thought of it as all three of them going into it. I genuinely did because I was excited for Val Kilmer because ever since Real Genius, I've always had a soft spot in my wow, heart that's, for Val Kilmer. That's a personal thing. It is, but I've always liked him because of that. Mm -hmm. Real Genius is just classic to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Top Secret is fine. Like, I mean, it's not my cup of tea. I uh, got to see where Kilmer was ex. I don't think he was selling movies anymore. Probably not. He was yeah. after Batman. And it was after more than likely The Saint. Uh, the Saints. I've got a special place in my heart for The Saint. See? For reason. Look at that. Coming back around to my side of the argument. <laughs> oh, that's copyright top ten. Jeez, I forget he was the voice of Kit in the reboot of Knight Rider. Wow. Gotta make that money, I guess. I don't uh, remember that at all. Gotta make that money. Never saw it. I value my time. <laughs> Where? <laughs> what year is Heat again? 96 or 95? Heat is 95. Okay. So, yeah, right. Batman Forever's that year. So, all right. All right. He's selling I, tickets, I babies. I will absolutely yeah. acquiesce on heat. Uh, so do I have to? So I have to replace it. Yeah, whatever you want. All right. How about Dark Knight? Ledger. Bale. Okay. My other option is when Harry met Sally. Those you do have other. like two faces in it just as much on some level as by the end is Joker. Eckhart? No one's going to see that film for Eckhart. Although it's a little stretch. He's not in it as much, but he no. does have... A, they're or, not going to see it for Eckhart. You're or, right. Or when Harry met Sally. Those are my other two options. Uh, when Harry met Sally, I think I wrote it down on my side list. I may not... Did you? I didn't even consider Dark Oh, no. I'm going to I'm I'm call an audible. It's your list? I'm going to call an audible. You go ahead and do that. I'm going to put point break at number two. That's Keanu Reeves. That's Patrick Swayze's son. Yeah. No one's going to no one's going to see that for Gary Busey. Uh, nobody went to see it. <laughs> what are you talking about? It was a but big hit. Point break. After the fact. <laughs> oh, you're insane. I lived through it. You were uh, like, so did I. You I were in your diapers. That is, what, what are you talking about? What did they come out? 1994? No, it came out in 89 or 88. Look it up. Look it up. That's a 90s movie. That is a 90s movie. 
There's no way that came out in the 80s. Man. 91. Barely. Doesn't matter. You were like two. How old are you in 91? 90s movie. How old are you in 91? Uh, 91, I was... You still went under who's? 13. Well, 12 going on 13. All right. 12, 13 going on 30. No one's going to see it with Lori Petty or Gary Busey or John C. McGinley. This is a two... This is the, and this movie made money. What was his box office? Hold on. Let's take a look. And then it, I'd like you to adjust that for inflation <laughs> so I can have an understanding of what $1991 looked like in 2019. $83.5 million. It made $83.5 oh, no, million. Adjusted for inflation? Oh, that's the, that's the, do you know they spent 105 on the remake? What the fuck? Well, because they thought they no could. no sense. I didn't watch that because everybody said it was just trash. It was trash. Uh, it was an... Uh, where is it? The budget of $24 million, it made $83 million. Three times its budget. Almost four times its budget. Got to give props. Is that adjusted for inflation or is that in well, it doesn't $1991? Matter. It doesn't matter. because It if, does. If the budget is $24 million in 1991 and the profit is $83 million in 1991, it still counts as three times the budget. True, but it would... Now, to be kind of where you think of maybe making another one, it needs to clear a certain benchmark. Like, we put in X, and it cleared $125 million. Well, that's what I'm saying. $24 million, it still counts because it's the same number in the same year. Yeah. It's double bill. You're good to go. I'm not, I'm not fighting you on it. It's a great call. $24 million in 1991 is worth today. What is it? No, no, $24 million. How do, can you do that? Did you go to that one site that won't let you put in millions that you went to <laughs> the last time you tried to do it? Because so I... it's forty-five million in today's dollars. Okay, so it went up. That's how much the budget was. So it made eighty-three million, which means one hundred fifty-five dollars, one hundred fifty-five million dollars for forty. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, it's not almost too bad. four times as budget. Yeah, Take but it's aside. not great. Oh my god! <gasps> well, it's not. I mean, for great... a film like that, I think you're, you, you're happy as shit that it made that much. Yeah, but great would be what John Wick does, and it does that in the opening weekend. Sure, not 150, now. but like 100, 120. Mm, I don't know if an, I don't know if a Wick film has ever opened. Oh, the last one opened pretty big. Fair point. Either way, point break. Keanu Reeves, uh, Patrick Swayze. Great choice. Swayze at the apex, Reeve at the apex, or about to become into his apex. So speed is about three years away, four years away. Uh, but he's off Bill and Ted. He's off these other things. He's playing this character, and people loved both these dudes. People love this movie. I can't believe I'm putting it above all the president's men. There's a bit of shame there, but I had a two slot to slide in. Yeah. So point breaks in there. What can I tell you? That's how the show works sometimes, folks. Uh, it slides in there. But I, I enjoy the movie. Love the movie. Come back to it all the time. It's a lot of fun. And yes, there are cheesy moments. Not going to deny, but it's still a damn good movie. Uh, all right. What's your number one? Uh, number one is Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Wow. Because as soon as we said this, that was the wow. first movie that jumped to mind. It's okay. Like, this was number, I mean, boom. We called Double Bill and we're like, well, mm -hmm. that was, the, honestly, that was kind of my introduction to two actors being able to do that. Okay. When I saw that. Uh, but I, I mean, it had been out for a long time before I right. saw that. Right, right, right. And it's not often though when you see two wildly successful and famous actors mm -hmm. willing to just share a movie together. Yeah. Try and actually make an interesting piece of art between the two of them as yeah. opposed to making it about me, me, me. Still making good art. Yeah. But me, me, me. Absolutely. Very funny film. Well directed. Mm -hmm. And, of course, um, a Western that was, what do they call that? A neo-Western? You know, it's like, it's more... Yeah. It know, doesn't follow the same exact tropes. Exactly. And it's aware of itself. Mm -hmm. Right? It's anachronistic at times. With, with some the, of the raindrops jokes. keep falling on my head sequence. Right, right. That just seems so foreign uh, in a Western. Mm -hmm. It's like, why is, okay, yeah, but there would be regular everyday life where you would have these, you know, right. moments of joy. And those films, those, film, those Westerns from that time purposely tried to undercut all, because that's an institution. The 70s were about undercutting, destroying, exposing the institutions, making fun of the institutions, thumbing your nose at the institutions. The institutions of the West, of the Western, throughout the 70s, were undercut and made fun of, and you had some interest, like McCabe and Mrs. Miller is an interesting Western for that time, uh, and certainly Butch Cassidy and Son of this kid, same thing. Like, in the Westerns of the past, you always had these, like, you know, moments where you looked at each other, but this is two dudes who are just flying by the seat of their pants, escaping into these situations, uh, and then, like, having an actual rapport with each other that is a very sweet mm -hmm. and connectable and relatable, and you like that. So much so that you want to believe they managed to get through the end. In the Bolivia, yeah. Even though you know there's just there's no way that anybody's going to make it out. But on yeah. some level, you're like, I don't know. I saw him jump into a river. 
You know, they've done crazier things. What are you kidding? What do you mean? The fall will probably kill you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the Hole in the Wall gang. Mm-hmm. Great name. Great name. And to see, like, the uh, desolate area that they go out into. Yeah. Is, it, is that in the Sonoran Desert where they do that? Um, I can't remember. I'll leave it up to you, man. I it's in the, you know, the southwest there. It's mm-hmm. one of the main, you know, more desolate deserts, and that's saying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to try and strand so lawmen wouldn't make it all the way out because they don't know where the water sources are and whatnot. So if they didn't bring enough provisions, they could easily die out here. <laughs> You're like, that's a hell of a place to go and, you know, call home. Yeah, fair to, point. To lay your head <laughs> and to make those people likable. Yeah. But, you know, with pulp novels and whatnot at the time, they were kind of likable. Like mm-hmm. Billy the Kid. People were fascinated by yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Billy Kid was great. But when you watch... Uh, Such a great character, rather, yeah. in history. Yeah. Yeah, the Brad Pitt, uh, Casey Affleck. Uh, mm. uh, why am I blanking? Oh, yeah, Assassination of uh, yeah, Jesse, Jesse James, James by the car of Robert Ford, yeah. To see what that's like, to be that incredibly famous at mm. that time, where Casey grew up, like, hey, yeah. we are the same. like Yeah. Same number of letters in our names. That's such a great point. And you're just, like, watching the film, and you're, like, squirming in your chair for Casey Affleck. Cause but, like, you're so desperate. To be relevant. How can you not? You've read stories and tales. Yeah. This is one of the few, like, truly pop culture individuals. Right, right. And he's in your house. Yeah. You did grow up. It's like us with, uh, you know, athletes or whatever the case was when yeah. you were kids. Michael Jordan was larger than life. Yeah, true. And if one day Michael Jordan was like, hey, we we're going to go rob a bank. And I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but are you going to be? I have a lot of my same number of letters in my last name as I you mean, do. Depending on what age I was at, <laughs> I, I would have been fair. more. I would have been more totally like totally fair. Do you remember in Game Four of this playoff series when you shot this for this and went to this and then you made that one pass and that pass would be I was like crazy. I would be going off about that. He'd just be like, uh huh, yeah. He'd make you shine his shoes in front of him. Yeah, towards so that kind of. I'd do it. <laughs> fair enough. Depending on what age, man. No problem. What do you need? What do you need? Hey, my drink could use a little freshening up. Not a problem, <laughs> not sir. A problem, not a problem. I got a towel over you my like shoulder. Spider. You like spider and a good fellow. Yeah. <laughs> what do you need? What do you need? You need a sandwich? I'll make you a sandwich. But nobody's ever shot at my feet. That's the beauty. That's true. Nobody would. Uh, which is a good thing. That's number one? That's my number one. What's your one? Uh, Shawshank Redemption. See, that's another one to me where it's so singularly Tim Robbins. Because like all the, the vast momentum of the movie is his journey. There are other characters that come up, like obviously Red, and then the one kid that gets gunned down. Um, Tommy. Tommy, thank you. You're an insane And person. Brooks. And, but to me, it's like it's the movie itself is Tim Robbins' movie. Yeah. I'm sorry about your brain and that it thinks this way about the movie. The movie is about Red and Andy and their relationship. Without Red, Andy is not, does not reach salvation. True. That's throughout the whole movie. But, and then when Andy leaves, we still have shots of Red in the prison by himself with the crew. But we live, yes, because we are. We do have shots of, but the story now has progressed to what Andy's doing. No, and, it's what Red too when he as, goes and does the uh, when he does the parole board shit. That's Red's story. True, but from Red's perspective, his story does not actually show up until he walks onto that beach and Andy is there. What? His story is from the beginning as soon as Andy walks up and talks to him. I'm saying from his perspective because his life has been – Red's. His life has been on hold, so the story of his life is nothing. It's meaningless details, and it begins when he meets Andy at the end, and that's when his story begins. I disagree. I think – A thousand percent. I'm not saying in the context – I'm saying from the the, the, the perspective of the character. Yeah. I'm saying I disagree. He's built himself a fiefdom in essence at that place, a black man at that time in that prison – he is the guy you go to to get stuff. Okay. He's made himself essentially top dog in that prison, not by running a gang or doing anything like that. He's the guy who can get things. And Morgan Freeman bring, brings a certain kind of stature and nobility to that character, so everybody defers to him. Even Andy defers to him. And he even bets on Andy, who is a submissive at the start of this movie, that he's going to crack first. And, and Red narrates the movie. Red narrates the movie. That immediately eliminates him as being inconsequential or not, a story not starting. I'm not saying, but he is narrating Andy's life. And it's his. Kind of. Oh to me, it's more it's, all, it's to me, it's more about Andy. Like, so you're saying he's the guy that can get things. We don't watch him go through the getting, but we do see what those goods right, but, bring to life over here. But Andy is changing him. Kind of. Yeah, yes, yes, he is. Fully, but 
that they're see, both changing each other. We don't see that shift as much as we do in Andy. I think it's so much more focused on him. I can't disagree with you more. I, I think you see him changing throughout. And, uh, you know, because Andy pushes him. When Andy goes and talks to Clancy Brown on the roof mm-hmm. and just stands right behind him to talk to him about and he's and, the, and Clancy grabs him and dangles him off the edge. Red tries to stop it. And that's the thing. Red has built. Red has constructed this world. He understands how to function within this world. He's a king of the world in this world. Andy comes in and fucks everything up. But by the same token, Red also uh, gets Andy to find his way back to being hu- human again. Okay. And all of so their journey. So the, and then we follow Red when he leaves the prison and what he goes through and the Brooks stuff and all that kind of jazz. So everything is Red's story is just as important yeah. as Andy's. But to me, that, like that, when you're talking about going through and the Brooks stuff. About redemption. To me, that's just him uh, describing pulling pages off a calendar. He's not living. Where in the prison? No, like when he's talking about like the Brooks getting out and him going to yeah, the bullboard right. and whatnot. He's, he's not experiencing his life. Al- he is experiencing his life, yeah. but he's not alive. So I, I don't. Yeah, and he's not alive until he gets to Mexico either. He shows more sparks by like locking the door and turning on the music so everybody can escape this prison and hear oh, this you're, songbird. You're and, saying he's willing to push the boundaries of the situation, but also it's still trying like last gasp for mm-hmm. life, and we're following all the. That's fair, but you also. But what does Andy say when he walks up to near the near the what three quarters away in the film? He says, "I got to get busy living says, and get up, busy bitches? dying." Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> I heard it. He says, "I got to get busy living and get busy dying," and the rest of the reason because he feels like he he's stuck. So that's what I'm saying. All right. Anyway, there you go. There's our separate top ten lists. I was I acquiesced on one. Uh, so be it. Uh, but I'm pretty proud of the list I created. Uh, let's uh, and now we'll combine this list, right? Correct. Oh well. Well, no wait. We should read our lists, right? Because usually the graphic comes up, right? We did in the old days, or do we? We did, but we won't have the graphic live oh, for right, us right, in right. studio. Good. Eventually, we will have the graphic. We'll line these th- these things up where the graphic comes up on the studio as we're talking about it. I'm hoping. I, I doubt that will ever come to pass. Well, if we send our list ahead of time, then it'll come up. You forgot we were recording today. Yeah, because it wasn't on the calendar. Now that it's on the calendar. True. But we'll we had been building up to this. All right, on Wednesdays, we're going to do this. And we only got one week into it. And you forgot. Well, because I also got sent to Australia starting yeah. next week. So true, it, true. It threw my whole brain off. You had distraction. Yeah. But literally uh, 20 minutes before, before I left and ran and got a cliff bar, yeah. we were having the discussion of what today's show was going to be. True. So true. you had it in your head. Right. Uh... But anyway, it doesn't anyway. really matter. Neither here nor there. Uh, I We're going to get it, right? We're going to get it. I also. would imagine most people are going to side with you about Shawshank, and I'm going to lose that argument. I'm fine with that. That's all right. I, I, I could be singularly, or singular, rather. Are you going to, uh, right? All right. That's fine. I'm going to get the bongos. Type. I'm going to get the bongos. All right. So one through ten. Writing it down. People on video can see it. There we go. There's our ten numbers. We got them all written out. There are a lot of choices. So for those out there listening, what, why didn't you have X and Y? It's, it's the same as last week. It's, it, it's hard to say what is a correct list on this because it's such a broad, True. great topic, subjective, but so broad. Subjective. It's what do you, what do you want? Yeah. Um, all right, so mm-hmm. Butch Cassidy and Sundance, you had where? I had it at uh, four. So I think that's our one four. There's nothing beats that. Okay. I gotta tighten these uh, bongos up. They're a little loose. A little loose. Yeah, a little loose. A little loose. And then. Okay. Your one I don't have. Your two I don't have. Right. We have Fight Club where? Fight Club? Five. Okay. That's three, five. Okay. Once upon a time, Hollywood is seven. Okay. So five, seven. Mm-hmm. And then that's it, isn't it? Do you have all, uh, the president's men? all the president's men? Now it's number six. So that's f- four, six. So I think Fight Club, all the presidents, and then you're number one. And okay. maybe Once Upon a Time. Sounds good. Okay. Where are we at now? That. What's your one again? It's a. Uh, uh, Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's all our commonality. Where are we at? The uh, number six. Okay. What's your next highest? Okay. I don't have my two. You don't have your two. Oh, yeah. What's your two? Last Crusade. Yeah, put it yeah. on first over my two because point break is shouldn't, you know. Although I do love the film. I think people love the film. 
No, it's a good one. Yeah. For this list, it, it suits it well. Squeezy. It definitely. Uh, okay, you're next after that. Th- Unforgiven at number three. Okay, Unforgiven it is. Next. Butch Cassidy at four. Fight Got Club that. at five. Got that. All the President's Men at six. Got that. Once Upon a Time of Hollywood at seven. Got that. Eight American Gangster. Okay, so my six and seven are not on this list. So put it on. Is no. that nine and ten? That is nine and ten. All right, let's make it happen. That's how the list happens, folks. We are fair. We'll fight. We'll battle. Teeth and we'll throw coins. But at the end, we'll come up with a top ten. Are you ready? Yep. All right. The top ten movies. Oh, okay. The top ten double build movies. Yeah. At number 10. Midnight Run. At number 9. Dumb and Dumber. At number 8. Unforgiven. At number 7. Point Break. At number 6. Uh, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. At number 5. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. At number 4. The Shawshank Redemption. At number 3. All the President's Men. At number 2. Fight Club. And our number one uh, double build movie is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Raindrops keep falling on my head. BJ Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. BJ Thomas. Uh, all right, well, there you go. That's our top 10 list for the double build movies. Uh, Matt, a good list, I think. A uh, great list. Yeah, and great once again, list. like we said, there's tons of different choices. And to those that watched us at uh, patreon.com forward slash the top 10, thank you so much. We thank did you. all of this uh, is thanks to you and for you. Mm-hmm. So we appreciate it. And for those watching on the, the once it comes out on Collider, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome to the show. We yeah. appreciate it. And uh, if you want to listen on our feed, you can still find it there on audio and also on uh, the Collider live feed. Yes, the Collider live podcast feed. Yes. Yeah. It comes out there the same day it does on our feed on mm-hmm. Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. It's just the video that's a week later. That's right. Uh, we're doing all this for the video. So we hope. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> and uh, once again, that's patreon.com forward slash the top 10 with the number 10. Please join us over there. We give you all kinds of different stuff. We try and do give back as much as we say we do mm-hmm. and a little bit extra. So uh, follow me online at Matt Nost, M A T T K N O S T. Matt, we tell them the Facebook groups. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the top 10 show with the number 10. Yeah, go and join that group because we uh, a lot of the fans come up with uh, questions and top 10s and battles and all that kind of a lot of fun. The Facebook group, very lively Facebook group. If you haven't joined the Top 10 Facebook group, go do that. A lot of conversations you get into about films. We enjoy watching it from afar, sometimes participating yeah. every once in a while. As Matt Fellow said, follow him at Matt Knows. Follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And thanks so much, everybody, for watching us or for listening to us. And we'll see you next time with another episode of the Top 10 Show.